okay. Good evening. I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order on November the 4th, 2019 at 7 o'clock. And very glad to have everyone here with us tonight. And also want to welcome all those who are watching our meeting uh, at home on television. We're glad to have everyone here with us. And now would you please join me for a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. Councilmember Reeves, could you please lead us in a pledge to the flag? Good evening, Mr. Mayor and <coughs> colleagues and uh, res Durham City residents. If it's your practice to do so and if you're able, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you very much, Councilmember Reese. Uh, now, uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Ms. Middleton. Um, we'll, has... we'll address that in a moment. Okay. And Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, would this be an appropriate time for that motion? Uh, that would be fine. Uh, uh, let me just state that uh, Councilmember Middleton um, is not able to be with us tonight uh, because of he is uh, helping one of his family members uh, through a, uh, a health emergency. Uh, and so he has asked us for an excused absence. And Councilmember Reese? That's, I'll make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote and please record me as a yes? And motion passes 6-0. Thank you so much. And now we'll move to our ceremonial items. And we've got just two items today, but really very great items today. And the first one is the Duke Energy Storm Resil Resiliency Grant Award presentation. And uh, if I could ask Chief Zoldos and Indira Everett from Duke Energy and Indira, whoever else that you have that you might want to bring with you, come on up. Is Chief Zoldos here? Well, then we'll have, we'll have uh, Deputy City Manager Bo Ferguson, who'll be representing the Chief. Um, this Duke Energy Storm Resiliency Grant was established to help North Carolina communities increase their response capabilities for future severe weather events with advanced preparation and planning. And uh, I will just, I think rather than saying what the fire department is going to be using these grants for, for I think I'd rather uh, just wait for Indira to talk about it a little bit, and then uh, if I have anything to add or Bo does, we'll take it from there. But we're very, very grateful for... Uh, the support of Duke Energy uh, for this project, and you'll hear about it, and uh, we're, we're just extremely grateful. So, Indira Everett, uh, please come to the microphone and, uh, and talk to us. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, and City Manager for this great opportunity. Tonight, I am super excited to make this check presentation to the City of Durham Fire Department and to Bo uh, tonight. Each year, the Duke Energy Foundation focuses its giving on K-12 education, workforce development, and nature. 
And each year, the foundation adds an additional new focus area based on the current needs of the state. This year, that focus was on storm resiliency in response to the devastating hurricanes we experienced in recent years. Duke Energy just awarded uh, this year to North Carolina several storm resiliency grants, and we're proud to say that the Durham Fire Department grant was ranked very high among them. I'm pleased to announce a $25,000 grant to purchase emergency response equipment, to increase capabilities to conduct severe weather rescues to preserve human life, and to provide specialized training to first responders. So I'd like to thank Ryan Campbell, who submitted this grant. And on behalf of Duke Energy, I'm here to thank Ryan, the fire department, and the city for partnering with us on this outstanding cause. And so I have a ceremonial check, but I also have the actual check with me. On behalf of the Durham Fire Department, I just want to thank the uh, generosity and the, the uh, partnership with Duke Energy for this important uh, grant. I know uh, have discussed uh, the uses of the funds uh, with Chief Zoldis. They're very excited to be able to add some of the capacity that this grant will provide in some of the swift water response equipment at stations and areas uh, that, that do have to deploy in situations like this. So we just, again, want to thank Duke, Duke Energy for the partnership, and we're, we're excited to be able to put these funds to good use. Thank you. It's great to have both the symbolic check and the real check. So thank you so much to Duke Energy, who's uh, last year they supported our tree canopy work with $100,000. They've given us a lot of wonderful support over the last few years. And Indira, thank you for your incredible civic leadership. And second, we're going to have a history moment for our second ceremonial item. And uh, I'm going to ask our public historian, Eddie Davis, if he would come forward. And Eddie will have others that he will invite uh, to, the, to the podium as well. Eddie, come on up. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, council members, staff members, and audience. Uh, thank all of you for your support throughout this sesquicentennial year. Today is Monday, November the 4th. 2019. In 1952, 67 years ago, November the 4th fell on a Tuesday. It was the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Thus, it was Election Day. Nationwide, retired Army General Dwight David Eisenhower defeated Illinois Governor Adelaide Stevenson. Eisenhower was joined on the Republican ticket by a 1937 graduate of the Duke School of Law, Richard Milhouse Nixon. Uh, Nixon was then serving in the United States Senate as a senator from California. Adlai Stevenson's uh, Democratic Party running mate was Alabama Senator John Sparkman. Here in the Tar Heel State and here in North Carolina, here in Durham, uh, Durham history was made on November the 4th, 1952, through the election of William Bradley Umstead, who would become the 63rd governor of North Carolina. This was the first and the only time a governor was elected from Durham County. Several other governors uh, had been elected from Orange County during the time when our landmass uh, was a part of that county. In 1952, Umstead and Lieutenant Governor candidate Luther Hodges defeated Republicans Chubb Sewell and Warren Pritchett. William B. Umstead was born in Bahama in 1895. He attended Durham High School, the University of North Carolina, and Trinity, now Duke, School of Law. In advance of his election to his gubernatorial seat, Mr. Umstead served as a Kinston 
North Carolina high school teacher, a combat officer in France during World War I, a Durham area district attorney, a United States congressman, a United States senator, a member of the Durham County Bar, a member of the prominent law firm of Fuller, Reed, and Umstead, and a member of Trinity United Methodist Church. He was involved in several famous Durham area federal cases, including Blue versus Durham and McKissick versus Carmichael. Although he was a moderate to conservative Democrat by those standards then, uh, Mr. Umstead was a, had a wide array of 1952 gubernatorial support here in Durham, including an endorsement from the Carolina Times and its crusading editor, Lewis Austin. Two years after he was, I'm sorry, two days after he was inaugurated in January of 1953, Governor Umstead suffered a, a severe heart attack. Although his health rose and fell uh, during the next two years, his term came to an end 65 years ago this week on November the 7th, 1954. He passed away at Watts Hospital here in Durham. This Durham County native lived, worked, studied, worshiped, and enjoyed many friendships in the Bull City. He received and provided a great deal of glory in Durham. History gives him the distinct, the unique distinction of, at least so far, uh, being the only Durham resident to be elected to the office of governor of the state of North Carolina. Governor Umstead was funeralized at Trinity United Methodist Church and buried at Mount Tabor Church Cemetery in Bahama. We actually have the current pastor of Trinity United Methodist Church here with us, Reverend Suzanne Pretty. Would she please stand? Thank you and the rest of the congregation here at Trinity right across the street. Uh, for all that you all do, not only for the city of Durham, but for uh, the less fortunate in our community. Um, we are also privileged to have with us Durham attorney Merrill Umstead Ritchie, the daughter of Governor Umstead. Uh, we would like for her to join me at the microphone and to share a very brief remembrance of her father. Ms. Ritchie. Okay. Um, my father had many close friends and supporters here in Durham. Both in his life and after his death, I wanted to illustrate that. The first thing is a plaque that my mother treasured. It looks like this, and I'm going to read to you what it says. Presented in tribute to the Honorable William B. Umstead, Governor-Elect of North Carolina, by the Civic Clubs of Durham, December the 2nd, 1952. In you we find those attributes which exemplify man's worthiness for service in public office, integrity, ability, dedication, dignity, tolerance, courage, sincerity, patience, and humility. We, the undersigned Club presidents bespeak for our members their pledge of confidence in you and further pledge to you the loyalty and cooperation of our clubs in any undertaking for the betterment of our city, county, and state. And it has the um, seals of nine civic clubs in Durham and the signatures engraved of their presidents. After my, dad, after my dad died, there, um, a local committee formed out of a felt need to make a memorial. This ultimately resulted in the William B. Umstead State Park being named for him because of his conservation efforts. My father practiced law in Durham after attending Duke Law School. His offices were in the post office building and the Hill building on Corcoran Street. He was also legal counsel for the Citizens National Bank, Corner Main Street, and Mangum Street. My father was a lifelong Methodist, 
His father was John Wesley Umstead, named after the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. In Durham, my father was an active member of Trinity Church, today the only church in the downtown loop, where he taught the men's Bible class for years. The present building had its first service in 1925. It was designed by Ralph Adams Cram, a noted church architect, and is unusually fine. I'm not sure what it cost, but I know it was a lot. In 1944, my father, who was chairman of the Board of Trustees at the church, together with the minister, Reverend Huggin, raised the money to completely retire the debt on the building. At Christmas time, my father and I would drive around Durham, delivering Whitman's sampler boxes of chocolates to his friends, always the same gift. He always bought his candy from Ralph Rogers Drugstore on the corner of Mangum Street and Parrish Street. Years later, I learned that the Whitman Company had sent sampler boxes abroad to the soldiers in World War I. My father was one of those soldiers. In his small way, he was thanking the Whitman Company for their long ago gift. As a veteran, he was instrumental in beginning American Legion Post No. 7 in Durham. Since the focus tonight is on my dad's um, service as governor, I brought his hat. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Thank you so much for that great presentation. Uh, thank you to our public historian, Eddie Davis, who's been bringing us wonderful Durham history moments throughout our sesquicentennial year. All right. Uh, now we will uh, resume our agenda, and I'll ask if there are any announcements by members of the council. Uh, I do have, I think this might be an appropriate time to, uh, we, we have another, um, another, excuse, uh, another excused absence that I need, that we need to uh, take up. I believe that uh, Councilmember Freeman and Councilmember Middleton are going to the National League of Cities Convention, is that correct? And, we, and you will be missing, uh, November 21st. November 21st City Council meeting? Okay. So um, can I hear a motion that we give Council Members Freeman and Middleton an excused absence for the November 21st meeting? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. And uh, will you also be at the work session or will you... It's only the work session. I'm sorry, the work session. My apologies. I said the council meeting. I'm sorry. The work session on the 21st. All righty. Um, other announcements? Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, tomorrow's election day here in the city of Durham. The 2019 general election in our city uh, races is tomorrow. Uh, on the ballot is the race for mayor, our three at-large city council members, and the $95 million affordable housing bond. Just want to make sure that those of us, uh, those of you here in the audience or listening at home who have not availed themselves of early voting, uh, please make a plan to vote tomorrow and make sure your voice is heard. Uh, these are incredibly important elections for the future of our city. Uh, we'll determine uh, for the seven seats on this council, including the mayor, uh, and it couldn't be more important to the life of our city over the next four years. So just encourage everyone uh, to get out and vote and to make that easier. Um, I'm really proud that our city has made our city bus service go Durham fair free tomorrow. Uh, that was a proposal, as I recall, that was brought to us by the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People uh, originally, and I want to thank them for uh, encouraging and inspiring us to make this an annual, um, an annual thing that we do uh, on Election Day. So uh, please make sure you get out and vote. Uh, like I said, these elections are pretty important. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Council Member. Are there other announcements? Councilmember Freeman. Uh, thank you. I, um, 
just wanted to take a moment and uh, reflect over the last eight days or so, um, I'm sorry, the last week or so, there's been about eight shootings, and most of them have been um, in neighborhoods I'm very close to, recognizing that I live, work in, attend church in East Durham. So I um, felt it was important to note that there have been a lot of community conversations going on, a lot of folks um, experiencing anger and hurt and fear. And I just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that that fear um, is a part of that process and recognizing the trauma of having someone ripped from your community um, due to gun violence. I know that we have the conversation around violence um, often on this council and, and addressing that. You know, we need to do more to regulate our gun laws, I mean, gun restrictions or have gun restrictions. Um, I want to be specific in stating that we also have to do the work to figure out how to address more immediate needs and recognizing that the people who are angry, the people who are, who are experiencing the hurt and the trauma um, need the support of us all right now. And recognizing that in a few of these meetings, um, a few things have come up and I wanted to share with council. Um, there have been a number of calls that have been made. Um, so noting that uh, between January the 1st and September the 30th, about 145 people have been shot and 518 reports have been made of a shooting. And with all of the people involved in each of those incidents, everyone's been impacted and re-traumatized, especially for those who've lost a child or lost a loved one. I mean, it just, re it just reopens that wound that's there. Um, we have come a long way in addressing uh, police resident uh, contact issues around the FADE recommendations, but I'm concerned that we have not had any uh, work done around the resident to resident contact um, recognizing that not just in law enforcement, but also in community, there's work that's being done and we're not supporting that from the city. And I would love to figure out how we do that. I know we have the long range plans of attacking root causes, which are commendable along community health and safety, uh, especially with the conversations we've been having around having a task force set up, but that's like what, a year or so away and these hurts and these harms are being caused right now. And what, what we can do about that is important. So also noting, I did a little math, back of the what, matchbook, back of the napkin kind of math, and recognizing that between January and September, uh, there were about 600, I'm sorry, 6,552 hours in that time period. And in that time period, every two days, someone is shot. And every 12.7 12, hours, there's a report of, um, of shots being fired. And these are not sustainable. And I recognize that there are many who think that this is um, acceptable. We, you know, we, we're working on it. I do not feel comfortable with saying that. And I really wanna lean in on saying that we can do more. And so noting my council colleague who is not here this evening, um, Mark Anthony Middleton made the comments a few days or so back and saying that we're not doing as much as we can as a council and I wanted to speak to that in saying that um, just noting like sitting with community members and hearing their stories, it's, in, it's impactful, but it's more than that. It's also qualitative data and that qualitative data has to mean something. So noting that there has been a call for a healing day at Rock Quarry Park next, I'm not next, but Sunday, November the 17th, where services and resources are made available to those who've been experiencing trauma and hurt in the community, um, creating space for youth to be um, youth um, together. And I would love to hear um, from my council colleagues on whether or not they would like to support that. There's also um, a call for additional police officers to honor the police chief's uh, C.J. Davis's request and her professional assessment of the police staffing needs. Um, there's also been a call for resources and supports for the credible messengers that we have in our community providing these supports on the street level um, that aren't engaged with law enforcement but actually are doing the work uh, as community members and volunteers. And uh, you know you're familiar with many of them. There's organizations like Together for Resilient Youth, Communities in Partnership, A Chance for Change. Um, there are so many here. Spirit House. I mean, these are all folks who are doing this work on a regular basis, based on their um, understanding of what it takes in our neighborhoods. 
Um, also, there was a call for parks and rec locations to be open and welcoming to our youth in the city, and I would really like to know um, among my colleagues who would be interested in working towards um, trying to get some of this moving in the next couple of weeks or so, because I don't think a, you know waiting for a ta health task force um, should be the the barrier for trying to address some of the calls that have been made by rec residents in the community. And so when it's appropriate, Mr. Mayor, I would like to figure out if, if we have at least a majority of council colleagues that would be interested in supporting that effort to address these calls. Thank you very much, council member. I would say that all of us are interested in that. I think I can speak for the entire council in saying that all of those things that you mentioned are very important. Um, I, I will, uh, certainly want to appreciate what you said and we are um, I think all cognizant of the fact that uh, we had a tough 10 days in the city and uh, I am grateful for our police officers and our police force who've been working on that uh, and also very appreciative of all the people that you talked about who are in the community because you're absolutely right. The police can't do it alone. It's got to be a community effort. And I very much appreciate what you had to say. Um, the, uh, I'll look forward to hearing more about the, uh, the proposed event uh, on November the 17th, I believe, as well as um, any specific thoughts that folks have about, um, uh, you mentioned our Parks and Rec Department. Uh, you know, of course, right now, our Parks and Rec Department uh, provides free after school programming for any teenager. Uh, and we, we will, of course, need to continue to do that. So thank you very much, council member. Uh, any other announcements at this time? I'll just uh, make one announcement. Um, I wanted to thank and congratulate the people who organized the uh, closing events for Durham 150, our 150th anniversary, which is a wonderful ev event that was held this past weekend. Uh, I was just incredibly grateful for the people at Discover Durham and the Museum of Durham History and all the other people, many, many people who contributed to making it such a fabulous uh, closing event for our sesquicentennial. And um, wanted to uh, just say how much I appreciated that and how much I've appreciated. We've had more than 150 events this past year to commemorate our 150th birthday. Uh, all, many of them sponsored by community groups and churches and PTAs and, uh, all, and all of these supported by the work of our sesquicentennial committee. So many thanks to all of them. All right, um, now I'll ask are there any priority items by the city manager? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of Council, good evening, everyone. No priority items from the City Manager's Office. Thank you, Madam Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Ma Mayor Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Members of the Council, the City Attorney's Office has no priority items. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, the City Clerk's Office has no items. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll now move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the Council. Items on the consent agenda are items that the Council has previously worked on. And I will read those items. No, oh, I'm sorry, and I forgot to add one important thing. Items can be pulled from the consent agenda by any resident or member of the council. Uh, and if an item is pulled, it will be heard at the end of the meeting. Uh, item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, Durham Cultural Advisory Board appointment. Item three, Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee appointments. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull that item. Item three, yeah. okay. Item four, Mayor's nominee for appointment, Durham Convention and Visitors, Visitors Bureau, DBA, Discover Durham. Item five, year end 2019 inventory performance audit dated September 2019. Item six, interlocal agreement between North Carolina Central University and the City of Durham to conduct participatory budgeting PB cycle one evaluation. Item seven, designation of community development department director as certifying officer for National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA environmental reviews. Item eight, interlocal agreement with the City of Raleigh for the Triangle Bikeway implementation study. Item nine, contract for landfill groundwater monitoring services. Item 10, amendment one to the Parkwood area lift station consolidation, PALSCO professional engineering services contract. Item 11, Ellerby Creek sewer outfall rehabilitation project, amendment number one to the professional engineering services contract. 
Item 12, miscellaneous water and sewer rehabilitation projects. Contract one for professional engineering services with CDM Smith Incorporated. Item 13, miscellaneous water and sewer rehabilitation projects. Contract two for professional engineering services with Kimley Horn and Associates Incorporated. Item 14, professional services contract for the Celeste Circle and Githin School lift stations. Item 15, September 2019 bid report. Item 16, selection of third party administrator for workers' compensation and liability claims administration services. Item 17, cooperative group purchase eight automated refuse collection vehicles. Item 18, cooperative group purchase four side loading collection vehicles. Item 19, condemnation action to obtain two easements at 408 Patterson Road. Item 20, condemnation action to obtain two easements at 418 Rondelay Road. Item 21, future disposition and redevelopment of 505 West Chapel Hill Street. We'll pull that item. Item 22, fiscal year 2019 Housing Appeals Board annual report. Item 23, City Durham, uh, uh, City Durham County Youth Work Internship Program Interlocal Agreement. Item 24, 2019 National Sexual Assault Kit Initiative Grant Project Ordinance. Item 25, contract amendment number one to contract SW49C, consultant project manager with Horvatz Associates PA for additional management services for various projects. Item 26, contract amendment number four for ST257C, contract administration and construction inspection services by Horvath Associates PA for the Carver Street Extension Project. Item 27, fiber optic network electronics installation. You have now heard the consent agenda, and with the exceptions of item six and, I'm sorry, three and 21, I'll now accept a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and second that we approve the consent agenda. agenda. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? And the motion passes 6-0. Thank you. And we'll now move to our general business agenda public hearings. And the first item is the consolidated item. The only item on the public hearing agenda is a consolidated item 4809 Farrington Road. And we will now hear a report from staff. Good evening. I'm Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. I would first like to state for the record that all Planning Department hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with state and local law. And affidavits at all notices are on file in the planning department. <clears throat> the city of Durham, uh, Durham proposes to change the future land use map and zoning designation of 12 parcels of land on the east side of Farrington Road, totaling 23.418 acres. The area is presently zoned industrial light with a development plan for a rail operations and maintenance facility associated with the formal, former light rail project between Durham and Chapel Hill. Go Triangle, the project sponsor and owner of the subject parcels, has officially discontinued the light rail project. During the public hearing process, the zoning map change, during the, during the, the public hearing process for the zoning map change, the city council indicated that if the light rail project did not move forward, the city would pursue a zoning map change to change the zoning back to a residential district. As a result, the city recommends uh, Rural Residential Suburban Multifamily, RSM, for this area. No development plan was prepared in conjunction with this request as there is no specific development proposal. A list of the available, a list of the allowable uses in the Residential Suburban Multifamily, RSM, zoning district can be seen in attachment seven. The subject properties are currently designated Industrial on the future land use map. That is attachment three. The city proposes to change this land use designation to low medium density residential to coincide with the zoning request. The Durham Planning Commission at their September 10th, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of 12 to zero. Staff recommends that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. The second is to adopt a consistency statement. And the third is for the zoning ordinance. I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Sunyak. Uh, you, uh, council members, you've heard the report from staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions by members of the council for our staff. Any questions for staff? 
If not, uh, we, will, we have two speakers to this item. Uh, first is Ruth Ann McKinney, and second is Phil Post. Uh, Ms. McKinney, uh, please come to the podium. Uh, give us your name and address. Welcome, and you have three minutes. Good evening. I have some laryngitis. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. Perfect. My name is Ruth Ann McKinney. I live at 5139 Niagara Drive uh, in Chapel Hill, which is in Durham County and uh, the city of Durham. Um, and it's also the Culp Arbor neighborhood, which is the over 55 community that's directly across the street from this parcel. So um, I was remiss in not saying thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to the council members for letting me speak uh, briefly. So I'm speaking on behalf of my neighbors at the Culp Arbor uh, community and uh, also surrounding communities and the parents at Creekside Elementary School. I think Mr. Post is gonna speak directly from the, um, a, a neighboring community, uh, also from the Oaks, uh, which is also nearby, but I'm speaking from neighbors at Maida Vale, uh, Trenton, Culp Arbor, the Creekside parents, and I'm probably forgetting someone. A number of those neighbors are here tonight. Many of them were here visiting with you all a year ago. Um, but if you'll raise your hands if you're here in support, um, which is we are speaking in support of this proposal. I want to thank Ms. Sunyak and her staff for having brought this forward, as well as the legal department for working with us and helping us understand it. Uh, Ms. Sunyak and her staff held a meeting out at Creekside in July, and I think there were 50 or more people there, uh, and they carefully explained to us uh, what, the, what was involved. We understand the zoning. We understand the comprehensive map change. Uh, it's not perhaps ideal, but it's a compromise that we're comfortable with um, and that we support. Um, we are particularly interested in the fact that it protects the buffer along I-40, the tree buffer, which protects all of us from the noise of I-40, which was what that buffer was designed to do. It also protects uh, in the zoning the watershed, uh, which is also important to us, and we'll continue to watch that in whatever comes to that uh, parcel when it's sold or if it's sold. So we encourage you, I'm speaking for all these neighbors, to encourage you to vote in favor of the city's proposal. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McKinney, and thank you for your persistence. Mr. Post. Um, my name is Philip Post. I'm a 40-year resident of Durham County. I'm speaking on behalf of the Homeowners Association for Oaks 3, which is 126 homes in Durham County. Uh, I want to first express my appreciation to the council and to the staff for following through on your assurances to return this uh, zoning to uh, residential. And I also want to express appreciation to the Planning Commission for their unanimous recommendation of support for adopting this rezoning and map change. And I simply want to say that uh, speaking on behalf of myself and my 126 other neighbors in Durham County, we urge you to adopt both the uh, land use map change and the rezoning tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Post. Is there anyone here, anyone else here, who would like to be heard on this item? This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone else in the room who would like to be heard on this item? If not, are there any questions or comments by members of the council at this time? All right, uh, hearing none, I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. We'll take three motions to approve this. Motion one would be to adopt the resolution amending the future land use map to low, medium density residential. Can I hear a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and second to adopt the resolution amending the future land use map. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you. The second motion will be to adopt the consistency statement. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you. The third motion will be to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. And the motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. And thank you all to the neighbors for uh, spending some time with us tonight. Thank you. That was shorter than last time, wasn't it? <laughs> all right. Um, we have 
two items. So I'll, I'll just wait a minute till uh, we the chambers um, settles down, and then we'll take on the uh, first item that was pulled from consent. All righty. Uh, the first item was that was pulled from consent was <coughs> by Councilmember Freeman, and that was item three. Councilmember? So I, I just want to note that I, in speaking with Councilmember Middleton, I understand there was a mix-up on his tally or something, and I just wanted to make sure that we didn't miss his opportunity to, um, to look I'm at I'm sorry, Councilmember, I can't hear you. I, I just noting that Councilmember Middleton indicated that he had a mix-up on his his vote tally, and so he just wanted to make sure he had a chance to look at it. And with him not being here tonight, I figured he could hold it till Thursday. Okay. Um, council members, without objection, uh, I don't see any reason that we couldn't go ahead and hold this until Thursday and then um, act on it by suspending the rules. Madam Clerk, would that suit you? I know that you've been trying to get this committee together. Would that be suitable? If it works out for you folks. Okay. Okay, thank you, council member. We're going to uh, hold this item until the work session on Thursday, uh, and uh, we will, at that time, we'll be able to suspend the rules and vote and establish the committee. Okay, thank you very much. I don't believe we need to do anything else on that, uh, Madam Attorney. I think we're good. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, we'll now move to the uh, second item that's been pulled from consent and the last item on our agenda today. Uh, which is item 21, the future disposition and redevelopment of 505 West Chapel Hill Street. This is not a public hearing item. Uh, so let me describe, I have uh, spent some time uh, talking to, to staff about the process that we're going to go through uh, this evening. And I know that staff has communicated this both to the uh, developers from Fallon as well as the developers from Ackridge. Uh, and so uh, let me just uh, describe what, how this is going to happen. Uh, first, we are going to be hearing the report and recommendation from staff. Then we will uh, have each of the development teams will have 15 minutes uh, to address the council uh, and can use that 15 minutes in any way that they would like. We're going to go in alphabetical order. That means Ackridge will be first, Fallon will be second, um, after which uh, there, there will be, uh, and after each individual presentation, I will give the council opportunity to ask questions at that time. And of course, council members can ask questions uh, throughout the process. Following that, uh, we will have members of the public who are not members of the development team uh, who would like to sign up to speak. Uh, if you are a member of the public who would like to sign up to speak and is not a member of the development team, please go to the clerk's desk and sign up, and we will give everyone uh, a time to speak uh, after the developers have uh, each had their own opportunity to present. So let me just go over it again so everyone's clear. First, we'll have the report from staff and the recommendation from staff. Then we'll have the developers each have 15 minutes to present in alphabetical order and can present anything that they would like to present uh, to make their case. We will go in alphabetical order, meaning Ackridge will go first, Fallon will go second. Uh, subsequent to that, members of the public who are here who are, have an interest in this, who would like to speak, but are not members of the development team, uh, this will be your opportunity to be heard. Council members, any, any questions, any concerns about that? I think everyone's clear. Okay. All righty. Um, and let me say that I already have a number of people who have signed up to speak on item 21. If you have already signed up, of course, there's no need to do so again. And I'm going to now uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Ms. Stacy Poston uh, for a uh, staff report. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of City Council. My name is Stacy Poston, and I'm here this evening representing the General Services Department and serving as the project manager for this project, which is the disposition and redevelopment of 505 West Chapel Hill Street. This evening, we also have available other talented members of departments, including Summer Alston from the Economic Development Department, David Boyd from the Finance Department, Thomas Leathers representing the Transportation Department, Karen Lotto from Community Development, Sarah Young from the Planning Department, 
Gina Probst from General Services, and our consultant team from HRNA, Elizabeth Packer and Kyle Vangel are on, are on site as well. This group of individuals, along with Deputy City Manager Bo Ferguson, have been working on this project with us since September of 2017. At that point, we began a review of all the existing policies and plans that had been adopted by Council. We conducted community outreach sessions that touched over 1,200 individuals that participated, and we received a recommendation memorandum from the City County Appearance Commission. We took all of that information and in 2018 presented that to City Council where we received direction to um, move forward with five objectives regarding the development of the site. This has been our foundation and our selection and evaluation process moving forward based on these five goals. The goals included affordable housing on site, financial return to the city, mixed use project with office on site, preservation of the existing Milton small structure on site, and delivery of a signature project with best practices in urban design for this gateway location. We have presented to City Council five times on this item as we've drafted and reissued the request for qualifications and as we drafted and issued the request for proposals. We received nine requests for qualifications from teams from across the country. After an evaluation process, we invited four teams to submit requests for proposals. Those proposals were due on June 28, 2019, earlier this year. We received three requests for proposals, submissions from teams, and ultimately determined that we wanted to interview in person two finalist development teams that had responded to the request for proposals. And we interviewed those teams here in Durham on August 14th. After the interview, we invited those two teams to strengthen their proposals in two specific areas, their financial offer and their affordable housing component and we gave them until August 19th to resubmit this information. The Fallon Company at that time submitted modifications to their proposal that strengthened their financial offer to the city. Ackridge declined to submit amen amendments initially and then changed their mind and submitted a revised proposal 11 days after the deadline on August 30th. The evaluation team re reviewed all the submissions from both proposers, whether the submission was late or not, and presented a recommendation to city council at work session on September 19th. At that time, the staff was recommending entering into development agreement negotiations with the Fallon Company. At the city's council meeting on October 7th and subsequent work session on October 10th, city council directed staff to communicate to the development finalist teams that they would be allowed to submit substantive changes to their existing proposals and that these revisions would be submitted to staff by October 18th. On October 18th, Ackridge submitted a development program with substantive changes and the Fallon Company submitted clarifying materials but held firm on their existing standing proposal. Since October 18th, the Evaluation Committee met, discussed, and undertook a thorough evaluation of all components of both proposals based on the five elements outlined in the initial RFP. We conducted information sessions with City Council members and drafted a staff memorandum that's in your agenda packet this evening that outlines the development proposal evaluation matrix. At this time, city staff recommend that the city council authorize the city manager to enter into negotiations with the Fallon Company and those elements being memorialized in a development agreement that we bring back to city council for consideration next spring. I and the team members stand ready to respond to any questions that city council members may have at this time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Ms. Poston, and uh, appreciate very much the report from staff. Uh, according to, uh, well, I, I'll ask first, are there any questions at this point for staff before we hear from the development groups? All right, thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll have some questions later. All right, we'll now hear from uh, the, uh, the first development group, which is Ackridge. And um, Mr. Spalding, are you uh, organizing this presentation? Great. You have 15 minutes and welcome. And for each speaker that comes to the podium, if you could just please give us your name and address. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor Shul and members let, of the council. Let me just, let me, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. I apologize one more time. For those of you all who are uh, maybe from, uh, uh, not familiar with our council procedure, we have a timing clock over here that might be helpful to you. I'm Thank sorry, you. go ahead. Good evening, Mayor Shul and members of council. My name is Matt Klein. I'm president and CEO of Ackridge from Washington, D.C. 
I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present the merits of the Ack Ridge team's proposal for the redevelopment of 505 West Chapel Hill Street. I'd like to begin by saying that I regret any distress we may have caused surrounding our advocacy for our proposal. Our company has been a successful real estate developer for over 45 years. We've been involved with over 20 million square feet of development. We've won awards for architecture, for historic preservation, for civic engagement, and business ethics. We've also participated in numerous RFP processes before, certainly well in excess of 100. We've won our fair share of these RFPs, which means we've also lost many as well. In almost all of the cases where our proposal was not successful, it was because a competitor offered a higher price. In this proposal, our price was, was highest by over 20%, and we offered the most affordable housing units, the two top criteria for evaluation. Our vigilance and advocacy for our proposal has been focused on making sure that the facts relative to our proposal were fairly communicated to key stakeholders, including council. We are competitive. We are invested in Durham, and we are excited about Durham's future. In our October 18th resubmission, uh, resubmission, we made two adjustments to our proposal. First, we adjusted the location of the office density such that it accommodated the preservation of the current building, the Home Security Life Building. As part of this process, we increased our office density by 15,000 square feet, which is less than 5% of the office program, and we added four residential units which is less than 1% of the residential program. The fundamentals of our site plan, including parking, urban design, and community space did not change. Because the densities are in direct alignment with our original proposal, the timelines and performance from our original proposal did not change and remain valid. In the second adjustment, we brought greater specificity to our closing date. During the August interview, we told staff we expected to establish an outside closing date for closing that was tied to the development management agreement. We brought specificity to this statement by establishing an outside closing date of 90 days from completion of the DMA. But for this design modification to accommodate preservation uh, and the clarification relative to timing on closing, our proposal remains the same. The staff report speaks to financial wherewithal. As stated, Ackridge is a 45-year-old real estate investment and development company that is successfully managed through six U.S. recessions. We have developed award-winning projects in all parts of real estate cycles. Institutional investors like J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Prudential see Ackridge as a highly qualified joint venture partner. Along with our multifamily affiliate, Jefferson Apartment Group, we have 12 active construction projects with $1.5 billion in construction costs we have more than sufficient financial wherewithal to execute our plan for the 505 project. As stated, Ackridge is already an active presence in Durham and developers in Durham, and we have more projects in the pipeline. We will close within 90 days following completion of a DMA, and we'll work hard to get a shovel, shovel in the ground as soon thereafter as possible. Our proposal offers clarity and certainty and requires no zoning adjustments, no special financing, and will be completed in one phase. An important strength of our proposal involves the team that we assembled. We have a great set of consultants and architects that are both highly qualified and represent the best in local capabilities. Most important, however, is the partnership we've developed with NSV Development, a local and minority investment firm that accounts for one-third of the ownership of our proposal. We know how important it is to have real, substantive local ownership that reflects the community, that leverages the diversity of Durham, and strengthens all aspects of our proposal. We're fortunate to have them as partner. I'll now pass the baton to Mr. Spaulding. Good evening, members of the Durham City Council. My name is Ken Spaulding. I represent Ackridge in this matter. Uh, first, Mr. Bonfield, we want to thank you so much personally and on behalf of my client and staff for your staff to allow us to have an opportunity to be one of the two finalists uh, in this effort and to be able to have this hearing tonight. We wanted to personally thank you and your staff in that regard. I would also like to say that uh, if you would, uh, as stated in your 
executive summary, the General Services Department has made its recommendation and preference. Tonight, the City Council will express your preference in making your decision. As we all know, the City Council makes its decisions based on the input from various sources, including stakeholders, the community, taxpayers, affected parties, and information presented by staff. We feel that our proposal is far superior to our competitors based on we are paying $2 million more to the city's taxpayers for this <coughs> property at 505 Chapel Hill, West Chapel Hill Street. In short, the city of Durham and our city taxpayers could potentially lose $2 million if our competitor is selected. We will, we will provide more affordable housing than our competitors. Here on the night before the election and vote on our housing, uh, affordable housing bond issue for $90 million, we're asking our taxpayers to reach in our pockets to help for fund more affordable housing. We're also saying, as we taxpayers will have to pay for this, we're also looking at the leadership of our council who's asking us to do this. And we're looking because we want to be able to say that the city council and our leaders are making sure that they also are seeing that we get more affordable housing in Durham and not just the taxpayers. We also want to be able to see that uh, the taxpayers will receive some of the money, $2 million worth, back to help defray some of the costs of the bond issue. We have only one phase while our competitor has two. Fallon creates a risk for the city if the second phase is not built. We have conventional ready-to-go financing while our competitor will require HUD approvals and financing, potential governmental tax credits, potential subsidies. That does not apply for us. We're ready to go on the financing. Accridge creates more local, more local and minority ownership in and for Durham. The mayor strongly asked both parties to consider this component when he and the council reopened submission. As far as historic preservation, we have preserved the building. We recognized and heard the historic preservation proponents. We have a better and stronger design which better protects the original building. Unfortunately, we must disagree with the conclusion and approach regarding the process used in determining the recommendation. Even with the original RFP criteria and now this very subjective, very subjective so-called advantage ranking met methodology, Accridge's proposal still comes out far ahead of Fallon's as the stronger proposal. We would really ask at this time, if you would look at your executive summary that was presented to you, you will find on page two of your executive summary, the next to the last paragraph that the approach that was used in determination for approval included this highly subjective and questionable analysis called advantage ranking methodology. This opened the door from objective consideration to subjective consideration. Let's further look beneath and unearth the findings beginning on page three, if you will look at your document, executive summary. It talks about provision of on-site affordable housing units. The methodology was used to diminish our success in having more affordable housing units compared to Fallon's 80. When development does not possess any unique financing, they have HUD financing and tax credits, which are not unusual, while Accridge has immediate ready-to-go conventional financing. Both companies are nationally recognized and pass the City of Durham's request for qualification process, the RFQ. As far as the next item on there, you indicate the generation of financial return. The pro forma was, has remained the same from our initial proposal. The program and design is consistent with the preservation of the building and Accridge far surpasses Fallon with the $2 million payment. Generation of financial return. 
The schedule remains the same. Fallon has more exposure to adverse economic conditions because Fallon has more office space, which will absorb more impact than Accridge in an economic downturn. Accridge's proposal is more balanced with its residential and office components. Office space suffers more negative impacts from a downward economy. After Fallon's number one and first phase, there's no guarantee of development of the second phase. That's risky for the city. Generation is your next Adam. Generation of financial return. Fallon's tax revenues are uncertain due to their two phases. Accridge has only one phase. The city will collect their funds immediately. The next, delivery of mixed-use development. Affordable housing and residential development are strongly needed in Durham based on all growth data. Durham already has at least 1.2 million square feet of office space in the pipeline near our location, Durham's Innovation District and American Tobacco. In regard to the delivery of mixed-use development, we are both equal from the report. In regard to preservation of the existing building, Accridge does not loom over the existing building. It is set back from the street, from the church, and from the building. Fallon's design will actually infringe upon the front part of the building, Fallon's will, and, fa and will uh, impact the face of the building, which does not align with the total historic preservation goal. The signature design and activated ground floor compelling design to highlight the site's gateway in your report. Accridge does not block the North Carolina Mutual Building and will not be taller than the North Carolina Mutual Building. It is believed that Fall Fallon will have a parking podium of at least seven stories, in addition to approximately nine or more stories of office, making them taller than the North Carolina Mutual Building. We have someone who can respond to that tonight. The signature design and activated ground floor. While we are doing, Fallon is discussing. We have true minority ownership, ownership, and we have included North Carolina Central University, which has been working with Fallon, have been working with Accridge for months and months and months, and they will receive $100,000 for scholarships and internships with our program upon the passage of this item. I want to talk to you about the word that was said at the Durham 150. I heard with you all, Kenya said, the biggest thing that Durham needs to be careful of is the G word, gentrification. What we're dealing with now is black ownership. That is what gentrification is all about. We talk about and we brag on, on, on the black Wall Street of Durham. <coughs> And in fact, there are only two black owners of property on the Black Wall Street, Paris Street. What we're seeking to do is to create an anchor with the mutual tower, which will allow an opportunity to create what we call the mutual district. This will be something that people will be talking about as they have the Black Wall Street in the 21st and the 22nd century about what we have as far as the mutual district, and this will be dealing with black ownership. I would also like to say that you have a choice tonight. This is your moment in time. We, it was a beautiful function that you had this past Saturday. It made all of us proud because both black and whites alike and Latinos and Native Americans were all shown the proper respect that our community deserves. But we just cannot live in the past. It is truly important that we make sure that we are there for that 21st and that 22nd century. And this is what that anchor can do with the mutual tower to create mutual, the mutual district. They and only they will have control of both parcels of land to be able to make this happen. Carl, I'd like for you to say just a few words. And he means just a few, Mr. Webb. Good evening. My name is Carl Webb, and I am a principal in New South Ventures, a 59-year Durham resident, native of Durham. We have really been 
uh, privileged to have an opportunity to work with, with Accridge. It's not often when a developer comes to town and seeks real partnership. Often what you see happening is opportunities to consult or sort of be in the room, but not opportunities to have true ownership. What we have here is a team that is made up of owners. We own and control 33% of this project. New South Ventures is controlled by greater than 51% African American ownership. We have Gloria Sheely of the Danielle Group that will help us build this, this project, an African American female headed organization. We have Zena Howard with the design firm of Perkins and Will, an African American leader that will help us build this, this project. So we're excited about having an opportunity to create this district. I have been inspired my, inspired my entire lifetime because of Merrick, John Merrick, uh, Aaron McDuffie Moore, and all of those who went on to create North Carolina Central University, Mechanics and Farmers Bank, Mutual Savings and Loan, and we're not waiting for the approval. We're working on Provident 1898, a co-working space that speaks to the next generation of entrepreneurs and creatives. So we just ask that you take this moment in time to give us all something in downtown Durham with all of the districts that we have to be proud of as African Americans of the significant contribution that we've made. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Webb, and thank you all for your presentation. Uh, I'll, since uh, uh, the Accridge group went a little over the 15 minutes, I'll give uh, Fallon another couple of minutes as well, if necessary. So thank you so much. Um, Council members, I think I would rather go ahead and just have the Fallon presentation, and then we can have questions for both groups. Is that everyone good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, yes, and um, if you all could take that down, I think that would be great. Thank you so much. We're happy to see it. But, yeah, thank you so much. And um, now we will um, hear from the Fallon Group. Mr. Banks, welcome. And uh, you also, uh, let's, I think, uh, add another minute, make it 17, please, Ashley. Thank you. You all will have 17 minutes, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And good evening um, to the other members of the uh, council. My name is Shariah Banks. I live at 5105 Carrollwood Lane here in Durham. Um, I'm the owner of the Banks Law Firm, um, which is generally regarded as the largest minority-owned firm in the state of North Carolina. And for 25 years, it has been uh, also a resident of the city of Durham. Um, I must say, first of all, that I am proud to be a citizen um, of Durham, um, where not only the city council, but also um, our county commissioners uh, have taken a look at our very dynamic downtown and has seen fit to make sure that affordable housing is here and is a vital part of what is going on in downtown so that people who work downtown can live. And so that makes me very proud. Um, tonight I'm especially proud to be a part of the Fallon team. Um, I think I'm a part of this team because my law firm has the largest collection of affordable housing attorneys um, in the state of North Carolina. Um, I'm pr very proud to be uh, representing Wynn Companies, which is the residential development of this project. Um, Wynn is the largest operator of affordable housing in the United States. Um, they are a very, very diverse company. They'll come up and tell you that. Um, but our design for this site um, has always been extremely inclusive. It's always been one building. It's always been um, affordable units um, in structured throughout that building. There has never been a different door for the affordable units versus the market rate units. There has never been a poor door in our project. And I'm very proud of that. Also proud to be a part of the Fallon team because, you know, this is a unique situation in that I've never done any legal work for the Fallon team before, as I have for the um, wind team, for the wind companies in the affordable housing area. But I know Fallon, quite frankly, because my law firm also represents the Charlotte Housing Authority. And Fallon has partnered with the Charlotte Housing Authority to do a very large mixed-use development in Charlotte. So in fact, I have been sitting across the table negotiating on behalf of Charlotte 
with the Wynn folks, I'm sorry, with the Fallon team. And I can tell you this about Fallon, though I don't represent them, I've never represented them before, but proud to be on the team. Fallon is an organization headed by Joe Fallon, and I think you also met the son, Mike Fallon. They are the type of organization that if Joe Fallon gives you his word, it's as good as a 30-page legal contract. They will hold up their end, they will expect you to hold up yours, and you can count on it. Since I live in this town, and it's rare that really I get the chance to do this type of development work as an attorney in this town, I can assure you that I would not be on this team if I didn't have a lot of trust and faith in the leader of the team. That's Joe Fallon, who I'd like to bring up right now. Thank you, Sherrod. Uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council, um, Pro Tem, and City <coughs> Manager, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, and I appreciate kind words, Sherrod. Um, there's, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about. We didn't get a chance or an opportunity to meet with you because we were told not to. So we, we, uh, we stayed with that commitment. <coughs> uh, but I think it's important that if we're going to develop in a city that the, you understand who we are and what we stand for. Uh, there are three major virtues that I have. Everyone on our staff, um, become, it becomes ingrained in them. And it's true, not just with our staff, but with all our consultants. <clears throat> it's passion, compassion, and respect. Um, we're very passionate about everything that we do. We spend time searching out cities that we want to work in. We self-fund. We put our own equity on the line. We're the ones that actually step up first. We have local people working with us. Uh, Duda Payne is a local architect who works with us in other cities and actually has one, one introduced this site to us. So we work closely with local, and we work uh, not just in Durham, but in other cities. And we work with a passion that we make sure that everyone feels the same. And compassion, and, and it's part of, again, our company. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have Michael, my son, working with us. But I have my daughter, Elizabeth, who heads up our foundation. We actually focus on, uh, on our foundation. We focus on um, people that are in need. Everybody at one time, everyone in this room at one time has needed help. Those are the people we seek out. Those are the ones that we try to find suffer in silence and we try to help them in every community that we work. That's what our foundation does. That's where we focus. It also has caused us to be very ingrained now in the special operations of the military and also Gold Staff families because, again, these are kids that just don't have the lead that they need. So we focus on those types of camps to help those kids. And integrity and respect. Respect is very key for us. We respect everybody that we work with. We respect the communities that we're in. But we also respect people that are working outside of our community, outside of our world, to try to make sure that they, too, understand it's important that everyone live up to their word, do what they say, and commit to that. So I want to bring, we're running out of, we're running out of time quickly. I want to bring others up. But at the end, I want to just mention a couple other things that will be important. Gil. Good evening. I'm Gilbert Wynn, CEO of Wynn Companies. And I wanted to say a couple things about our proposal, really to underscore. So we are the largest operator of affordable housing in the country. In addition to that, we've been in the state of North Carolina for almost 20 years. We're one of the largest operators of on-base military housing for our fighting men and women in the Marine Corps housing in North Carolina. We're affordable housing owners and managers in the state of North Carolina. And when we invest in a city, we generally stay there for decades and we invest again in new projects. We are not flippers of housing. We don't go buy, develop, and sell. <coughs> in fact, our very financing vehicle here today is a 35 to 40 year financing vehicle through HUD, which greatly reduces risk. Because in the down markets, when interest rates can fluctuate and underwriting guidelines can fluctuate, that is in fact the reason that the HUD financing exists. So that projects with affordable housing and that are good for the community will proceed in all events. In addition, I want to talk about affordable housing as something that we have included in our proposal from the very beginning, our single building with mixed income housing that has undifferentiated finishes and entrances is something that was part of our proposal from the beginning. 
I think that that's important, that we didn't have any buildings at different parts of the site that were only for the affordable folks. We didn't have the best building in front just for the market rate folks. And whether or not those uh, proposals changed is really not the point, because changing a proposal will show a willingness to mix incomes. But having those affordable units mixed in from the very beginning shows a desire and a belief that that type of middle income housing can work. Sorry, mixed income housing can work. That is who we are. It's ingrained in wind companies. Our over 3,000 employees are comprised of a majority of minority team members. That has taken decades, and we live by our word. When we are in new developments, we meet or exceed every local and minority women-owned business goal in every project that we do. In this project, we're proud to be partnered with James Rogers, who is a co-owner with us. He's a local minority real estate developer, and he, will, he was part of the team from the beginning. In addition, our retail component has Dr. Henry McCoy leading the charge to make sure that we set aside ownership in the retail component for local minority investors. And because Dr. McCoy is leading that effort, we have no doubt that that will be successful. We are very proud of our track record. And again, it's evidenced by the fact that we continue to do business decades later in the cities that we do business. I want to talk, uh, I want to have our company, excuse me, talk a little bit about what mixed income housing means. That doesn't just promote, to promote diversity, but it also promotes inclusion because it's easy enough to put a mix of incomes in a building. It's harder to create a truly inclusive community, and we've done that for years. And I'd like to introduce Shawnee Wilcox, our executive vice president, who can talk a little bit more about those successes. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. I'm Shawnee Wilcox, Executive Vice President with Wynn Residential. And as part of the Fallon and Wynn team, I just really want to emphasize how important we believe this project to be and our commitment to making sure that 505 West Chapel Hill Street becomes a model project for the city of Durham. I want to share five quick points with you, all of which are items that I think are critical of critical importance. One, we understand the importance of the rich history of the city and will do everything possible to ensure that that history is not lost. Two, this project can and will be a catalyst to improve the socioeconomic status of the affordable housing residents through the modeling and exposure to people unlike them, um, excuse me, that will naturally occur. Three, Wynn has been very successful throughout our almost 50-year history in helping to create communities and not just building buildings. Our approach to creating connected communities is different from any of our competitors. We get involved with our communities that we serve, and we lay the foundation for long-term sustainable relationships, and we want to do that here. No one has been successful as when with affordable mix, with the affordable mixed housing model. I want to stress again that we are the number one manager of affordable housing, and that's for a reason. I'm not saying that we're perfect, but we strive every single day to do the right thing by the people that we serve and the people that we partner with. And we will do the same thing here in the great city of Durham. Finally, you will not be disappointed with this team you will find that we lead with integrity, with passion, and a commitment to really seeing this through. I thank you for your time. Have a great evening. Thank you. I believe you've been here before, sir. <laughs> How much time I got? <laughs> Seriously, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, city manager, city attorney, and city clerk. My name is Bill Bell. I reside at 1003 Huntsman Drive, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I was contacted by members of the Fallon team sometime in late August after Fallon had submitted a response to the 505 West Chapel Hill Street RFP to the city, and that was June 20th, 2019. I was not aware of the RFP at the time, nor did I know very much about the Fallon company 
and their team, other than what I personally knew about the local team members. After doing my own research on both major companies on the team, and I mean Fallon and Wynn, I was impressed with what I discovered that they had accomplished in their, in their successes in the development of mixed income urban housing, as well as their success in commercial office space and real estate development. They had approached me to consider advising their team in some of the following areas. I to advise them on their approach to building community and city support, to provide feedback on the development concept, such as the design, mixed income, and commercial retail concept, to help facilitate connections and introductions to individuals or groups who needed and were appropriate, and to consult with the team and to provide preparatory feedback during the interview and selection process. I want to emphasize that at no time did I contact any member of the city council or the city staff during their initial RFP preparation or the deadline when they submitted June 28, 2019 nor did I contact any city council on the decisions that were made on October 7th to reopen the RFP process to allow for further information to be submitted from both development teams. In other words, I never requested any member of the city staff, city council, that they support Fallon team during this whole process. As you will see in the last RFP submitted October 18th, I consented to having my name listed as part the team as an advisor, which I thought was appropriate given my involvement as described. And finally, I will say that in my discussions with the Fallon team, I found them to be honorable and to have integrity with their proposals. As a company, I trust that they would do and deliver what they promised. I have also told them that if they were successful in being selected, I would have no hesitancy in speaking out if I felt that they were not keeping their promises with respect to development and what they have promised the city and this community. And over the years, I've had opportunities to meet with many developers as well as having reviewed many development plans. And I would say that the Fallon team ranks among the highest with respect to integrity and definitive development plans and processes. And I reckon them, them very highly for the 505 West Chapel Hill Street development as they have proposed. And I, I know a lot has been talked about in diversity. I have no question in my mind that given the foundation of what these people have done, they will make an impact in the minority community if they are given this proposal. Uh, if you notice in your uh, proposal, uh, Mechanics and Farmers Bank is one of the partners in this project where they will be making investments which obviously which allow Mechanics and Farmers to spread their investments in the community. So in my opinion, uh, they come highly recommended from all sources, but more importantly, I trust them. I know they would do what they say will do and it will make us proud of the development they put forth. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's the longest speech I've ever heard Bill Bell give. So. <laughs> Seriously. It's great to, great to have you in the house, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, just in closing, I want to just identify a couple of things that when we commit, it's not just a financial commitment, it's a commitment of our team. So we're committing tonight that our team is going to be there to do everything that we need to do to make this a strong community development. And for us, we appreciate your time. We appreciate the, the staff recommendation, and we appreciate your vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. So while we're at recognizing mayors, I do want to say that uh, former Mayor Whip Gully is also in the house, and we're glad to have you here as well. All right, uh, colleagues, uh, we, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, we have a number of speakers who have signed up. Has anyone else uh, signed up, Madam Clerk, in addition to these cards? Thank you. But let me just remind everyone, if you would like to speak up, would you, if you would like to speak, please uh, go to the clerk's table there and, and sign one of these cards. Uh, council members, any questions at this time? I'm going to go ahead and, and, and uh, call on the speakers unless there are questions at this moment. Everyone good with that? Okay. We have quite a number of speakers, so I'm going to ask that everyone please hold their uh, comments to two minutes. 
and I'm going to uh, begin with uh, Stella Adams. Ms. Adams? While Ms. Adams is coming forward, I'm going to call the names of the next couple of speakers. And if you all would please just make your way over here to my right. Um, second will be Omar Beasley. Third will be Cheryl Brown. And then uh, John Warsilla, if you all could make your way over here uh, and uh, be prepared after Ms. Adams, that would be great. Ms. Adams, welcome. Thank you. Have two you. minutes. Y'all know two minutes is tough. I know. <laughs> My name is Stella Adams. I reside at 4128 Cobblestone Place and appear before you on this item as a citizen of Durham for over 50 years. I come before you to ensure that you as a council stay focus on the purpose of the proposed sale of the police headquarters at 505 West Chapel Hill Street which is to increase the number and quality of affordable housing units available to residents of Durham, both downtown and throughout the city. I stand before you to urge that no points or consideration be given for the historic preservation of the former police headquarters. The preservation of the police headquarters a symbol of black and brown oppression personally offends me. I am curious how it is that we must preserve the police headquarters while a mere facade, a piece of a wall, is all that was required to preserve this city's legacy as a worldwide center of the tobacco industry. I have heard all of the arguments made by those who seek to preserve the building, and I am not persuaded. The police headquarters building by its own admission has, no, has not aged gracefully, and despite costly upgrades to its HIVAC system, roof, and building envelope, it remains uncomfortable, leaky, and expensive to operate and maintain. The building is functionally obsolete. And that was, if that was true in 2014, it certainly is so now. I understand that the developers have done a test fit of the facility as a person who recently um, was part of an executive team that purchased and completely overhauled a historic building in Washington, D.C. I can assure you there is a big difference between a test fit space plan and the actual renovation. I can almost see the developers coming back to you saying that it is not feasible to renovate the building at the proposed cost and secure funding. Will someone yield me 30 seconds? Ms. Ms. Adams, I'll, we don't yield, but I'll go ahead. I'll give you 30 seconds. You're fine. Thank you. They will come back requesting a different mix of affordable units in order to complete the project. They will propose units with cheaper amenities for the affordable units subjecting our neighbors to daily stigmatization. No, the police headquarters needs to come down. If the council is persuaded to preserve the legacy of Raleigh modernist Milton, then I would argue that the council has the opportunity to fulfill the final vision of Durham architect Phil Freeline. When it comes to 505 Chapel Hill Street, let's plan a historical marker and call it a day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Adams. Next, we'll have Omar Beasley. Mr. Beasley, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Omar Beasley. I reside at 3204 Skybrook Lane, Durham, North Carolina. Equity. Equity is important to me. We at the Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People are supposed to fight and advocate for the empowerment of black people here in the city and the county of Durham. So that's what I'm here to do advocating for black empowerment by simply asking you all if the Durham City Council to practice what you preach. Vote the way your progressive ideology says you should. Be deliberate, be intentional. 
be deliberate to bring about some equity in a downtown that there is none. As it was mentioned earlier, that there are only two African American property owners in the historical black Wall Street district. Is that shared economic prosperity to you? I would certainly hope not. While I know all the develop, while I know the de African Americans on the development teams for both projects, have the utmost respect for all of them. So I'm not here arguing for one group because I like them all. I'm here arguing because I'm asking you to do what's right. I'm here to do what the mission of the Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People says we're supposed to do. Uncompromised conviction of our mission within me has me speaking not for Ackridge but for equity. Ackridge did something that we all should be rewarding. They partnered with a locally owned black developing group and gave them 33% partnership. Think about that, digest that. In a district where there's hardly no black ownership. Mayor Shul, you asked to postpone this vote a couple, uh, about a month ago, citing the equity component as the reason why we need to relook at this. New South Ventures is getting what you wanted to, uh, to look at. Fallon says they have equity partners. We want to know what that is. Is it 33%? The public deserves to know. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Beasley. Uh, next, we will hear from Cheryl Brown. Ms. Brown, welcome, and you have two minutes. Good evening. My name is Cheryl Brown. I'm a Durham native and proud community supporter. I'm the owner director of Brown's Early Learning School, which is a five-star childcare facility in Durham. And we have proudly served our citizens for the last 47 years. My family and I have lived, worked, and thrived in Durham for 50 plus years. During that time, I've seen a lot of changes. While most have been for the better, there have some that have been proven or may prove to be detrimental to our very own. I believe that the proposed design by the Fallon Wind Development Groups will greatly benefit and positively impact the Durham community as a whole. The proposed redesign of this iconic structure will help to add value to the area while preserving its history. It will provide much needed affordable mixed income housing for residents of our community. The building design will help foster a sense of community and accountability that seems to be lacking in today's society. This will impact the lives of future generations by providing them with role models and positive influences that they are able to relate to. Men and women who look like them, who can see them, who can touch and interact with them. This is Durham's chance to be at the forefront of what we want the future of this diverse city to look like while continuing to maintain the iconic visual images of our downtown landscape. A development like this will put people from all backgrounds and upbringing together and allow everyone to learn and grow with one another. The beauty of Durham is its diversity, and I believe that our housing choices should reflect that, which is why I support the selection of the Fallon Wind Companies as the recommended developer for this project at 505 West Chapel Hill Street. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Mr. Warsilla, welcome. Uh, while he is uh, coming up, if I could call the names of the next three speakers, and if you all could please Make your way over here to my right. Uh, next, we'll have Marsha McNally, Ellen Weinstein, and Lou Myers. If uh, those folks are here, if you all could come over here to my right, that would be great. Mr. Warsella, welcome, and you also have two minutes. Terrific. Thanks. Uh, appreciate you putting this together. So um, I've been a resident of Durham since 1995. I served on the executive committee at DDI for probably 10 years. Uh, much of that early late 90s, early 2000s. So the first thing I would say is the fact that you're even having a discussion like this speaks volumes for how far Durham has come. To get this caliber of development in Durham is something we only dreamed of in those days. So kudos to everyone involved in that. Um, over the past year, we've been working with Pendo, large startup headquartered in Raleigh, uh, helping them find a site the site they settled on was a site that's being developed by the Fallon Company. Uh, over the course of that year, we worked pretty closely with the Fallon Company on Pendo's behalf, right? So we're Pendo's architect. So we got to 
kind of kicked the tires up close. We flew up to Boston, looked at the work they'd done up there, found that to be really pretty exemplary, and uh, found them all to be pretty stand-up people. So I would be a huge advocate for working with someone like that in Durham. These are exactly the caliber of people you want to work with, both in terms of ethics, uh, financial capability, but more importantly, development expertise. This is that's a rock star team. So um, I can't say enough good things about what I think they can bring to the table. I think both sides are probably highly qualified, but I can only speak from my personal experience, and I found them to be terrific to work with over the past year. So um, that would be our advocacy. Thank you, Mr. Wasella. Yep. Next, we'll hear from Marsha McNally, followed by Ellen Weinstein. Ms. Weinstein here. And, and then uh, Lou Myers. Ms. McNally, uh, welcome. You have two minutes. My name is Marsha McNally. I live at 203 North Church Street in downtown Durham. And I'm here representing the Coalition for Affordable Housing and, and Transit. Uh, we uh, were, um, I want you to know that we were um, approached by, met with, and talked with both um, teams um, as a coalition. Um, but we're not here to recommend or advocate for one team or another. Rather, we are here to basically um, advocate for a set of uh, principles um, or criteria that we've developed through the um, process of, of participating in this two-year process that the city's undertaken. Um, and they are as follows. A good project, in our mind, would deliver at least 80 units of affordable housing on the site at 60% below or below AMI. 60% uh, below or AMI, um, not a blend or an average. Uh, it is willing to accept, the developers are willing to accept, if available, DHA housing choices, vouchers, and project-based vouchers. Delivers the housing quickly. In other words, it's part of the initial phase of the project. It blends or scatters the affordable housing units across all buildings, residential buildings, as opposed to only in one, um, in one or some of the residential buildings, so that actually the project is indeed uh, mixed income. It is developed by a group that has substantial experience in the development and operation of affordable housing. And to sort of underscore that, it has a commitment to operating the affordable units long term. The affordable units are deed restricted in perpetuity. It does not rely on a 9% LIHTC, therefore does not compete with DHA projects in the pipeline. Uh, the developer has an equity stake in the affordable units, and the development team designers commit to meaningful community participation process. Even though it's been um, a unusual process that we've participated in, we really are grateful to staff, and we look forward to working with um, uh, everyone in the city and city council, um, whoever is is chosen in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNally. Ms. Weinstein. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, okay. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll hear from Mr. Lou Myers. And while Mr. Myers is making his way, uh, I'll call the next couple of speakers, Rob Codwallader, Michael Page, and Dr. E.L. Allison. And uh, we'll begin uh, now, though, with Mr. Myers. Welcome, and you have two minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm Lou Myers. I live at 208 Rigsby Avenue here in Durham. I've been in Durham for uh, 38 years. Um, I'm here to speak in support of the Ackridge project, the Ackridge team. And it's not that I don't think that both teams can do the project, but we talk about equity and inclusion and participation of minority-owned firms, and certainly Durham has been at the forefront of this. Um, I was in state government when we started these minority business programs, and so we're certainly at the top of the class. But this is an opportunity to talk about equity. You know, this is a transformative opportunity. We're talking about 33% ownership going to a black-owned company. And why is that important? Both teams are going to meet the goals for whatever the participation is, 20, 25, 30 percent in terms of contracts. That's good. But at the end of the day, 
If we are going to talk about dealing with the disparity in equity and net worth, it's about ownership. So I think that this gives Durham an opportunity to put, you know, act where we, we, where we talk. Uh, again, I was at the event on Saturday evening, and uh, it was a moving event, I thought very well done, but you look at what the Dukes did to step up and make some capital available for uh, the Merricks and the Moors to own, and as a result of that ownership, you had the North Carolina Mutual, you had the mechanics and farmers. So at the end of the day, the project will be there. I think it will be a great project, but it's about ownership and equity, and this is a chance to do it. I've never seen a project of this size come particularly to downtown with black ownership. I happen to be uh, the president and CEO of the North Carolina Institute of Minority Oc Economic Development. We own one of the two buildings on Black Wall Street. And I think Durham, in the street language, we tend to pimp that, talking about Black Wall Street, Black Wall Street, but there's nothing there but two buildings. This is an opportunity to rectify that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Mr. Codwallader, welcome. And you have two minutes. I'm Rob Cadwallader. I've been a resident of Durham for over 40 years, and I'm here primarily for two specific reasons. Uh, a little over a year ago, I made a pledge to Fail Win that I would help him develop affordable housing in Durham. I didn't know squat about how to develop affordable housing, although I've done a lot of other development. But I understand finance, having been a banker in this community. He died the next day, literally after I made that pledge. Um, I'm very familiar with the Fallon Company. I'm familiar with the Wind Company and what they've done in various markets. And honestly, I feel it was a gift to learn that they were here. I've worked with a number of members of this team in development that I've done in this area, initially with Traeburn years ago, project in Washington, D.C. I absolutely believe that Integrity is probably the most important quality in dealing with anybody. And in interacting with this team and the people with whom I've worked in the past, I know them to be honest. I know that they do what they say they're going to do. I trust them. And at the end of the day, I think trust is probably a more important quality than anything else. And as I'm sitting here looking at this team, I know that they're gonna deliver what they say they're gonna deliver. I'm not gonna say that it's not gonna be without bumps in the road. Life is filled with bumps in the road, but I believe that this team will overcome those bumps and make this a very successful project for the city of Durham and make us all very proud. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Cudwallader. Uh, now we'll hear from Michael Page. Welcome, Reverend Page. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mayor Shule and to members of the City Council, I am Michael Page, and I reside at 702 Basil Drive here in the city of Durham, and I'm pleased tonight to be able to stand on behalf of our Chancellor Johnson Accolade and the entire North Carolina Central University uh, campus in support of this project, and particularly the support of the Actridge Group, who has been really working with NCCU for, over, for quite some time to help explore ways that would really be a continued collaboration between the students of the university and the development of the mutual district. Partnership and development with this, with this development were concerns and should be concerns of common interest. For many of our students have a keen interest in the Black Wall Street of Durham, the success of black entrepreneurship to, as exemplified by the North Carolina mutual story. An opportunity to participate in paid internships by Accridge, uh, which teach the current day achievements of the African-American entrepreneurship can be very much changed the lives of our students and their future careers. So we welcome uh, the outreach from Accridge as well as NSV as we would like to continue our collaboration and involvement through the important internships that they provide. By your support of Accridge, in NSV in this proposal, NCCU students would have an opportunity to participate 
in Durham and in Central's community engagement efforts. We also want to acknowledge that Accridge and SV have agreed to fund this initiative in the amount of $100,000 for the full and complete benefit of our students and their immersion into business, history, and success. So again, I too was one of those persons who really appreciated the Durham 150 celebration on Saturday night and the way you provide the rich history of the entire community. But again, this is a wonderful opportunity to preserve our community and really help continue to promote much work that has been done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Page. Uh, we have, uh, now we'll hear from Dr. E.L. Allison. Dr. Allison, welcome. Me too. No problem. <laughs> Take your time. Dr. Allison, we are glad you're here tonight. And I know most of these persons that look like me who've come up here. And if I had the time, I could, in fact, talk about each and every one of them. Ken Lewis, I see you back there. Good. I'm E.L. Allison, representing the North Carolina Leadership Conference, Inc. I spent most of the time coming up here with an organization that I've spent my life in. And it's messed up. And I'm not going to deal with that. My mother worked for Dunbar Realty and educated three girls. My sister, my older sister, was buried November, I mean May 5th, on her birthday. My youngest sister, that most of you know, Carolyn, she was the first one to die. I'm the last one of three kids. My father died when he was 35 years old. My mother was 32. I'm here because. They gave me some information. I asked questions. I didn't even have to ask them a question. It's right here. Mixed use. Venus and Serena, they had to leave Oakland. They had to be around some folk that were a little bit better. You can't put all the poor people like the government did. You get what I'm saying? Mixed use is excellent. That green plaza, the first level, I'm fascinated by that. It can do so much, and they have said what they're going to do. Seven of the people, most of them are local people here. And they, I have met every one of these big, powerful money people. I didn't ask them any questions. They gave it to me. So I'm standing here for the Fallon group. Everything that I want the other folks, they say can't going to be done. It's going to be done because I don't be there telling them to do it. And when I ask somebody to do something, if they say they're going to do it, then I expect you to come up and do it. And I think I trust these people. And, uh, you know, I was ready to come to tears. I am just, look at what we've happened in Durham. Mm. I can cry. Everything we've lost. My husband spent 17 years as the president of a bank. North Carolina Mutual, go and accept a building. You got to pay the park up there. I don't want to start on that. Support these people. They're going to do what they say they're going to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allison. I can cry. And I love all of them. All right. We have two more speakers. Uh, well, we have several more speakers, but uh, the next two speakers are Mr. Garrett, Mr. Dennis Garrett, followed by Ms. Minnie Fort Brown. Mr. Garrett, welcome. You have two minutes. How y'all doing? My name is Dennis Garrett, and uh, I reside here in Durham, and I ain't got all them acclimates behind my name. I'm from the streets. Like, what I'm saying is, like, there's a lot of criminal activity going on in Durham, and it's because of poverty. How many of y'all going to hire us to come in? Like, I got a training program for ex-offenders that's coming out of prison, and they ain't got nowhere to go. They ain't got nowhere to live. You're talking about affordable housing. Affordable for who? Like, we, we got to make it so that our people and have somewhere to go so they can stop shooting up the community. So my mayor can go into BP and pump gas and not worry about a ride by. Like, what are we going to do?
to subsidize this criminal activity. It starts with the poverty. All the offer felon that's got some important names. You ain't been to my neighborhood. Like, so bring my neighborhood to where you live so that we can have a chance of life, too. So, like, I got some business cards. Which one of y'all want them? Like, Give them a job to build the houses so they can have somewhere to live. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Ms. Ford Brown, welcome. Thank you. I am Minnie Ford Brown, a native of Durham. I live at 1612 Merrick Street. You've heard a lot about John Merrick. Well, my street is named after him. I attended the Durham 150 celebration, and I was so very happy to see the inclusivity of my community and its history reflected on the screen and the impact that black folk have had on building Durham. You quoted W.E.B. Du Bois in his article that talked about the upbuilding of black Durham, the success of Negroes, and the role, the value in the tolerant and helpful southern city, Durham, where a black man could get up in the morning from a mattress made by a black man and a house which black men built out of lumber which black men cut and planed. He may put on a suit which he bought at a colored haberdashery and socks knit at a colored meal. He may cook victuals from a colored grocery in a store which a black man fashioned, he may, on a stove with a black man fashion. He may earn his living working for colored men, be sick in a colored hospital, buried from a colored church, and the Negro Insurance Society will pay his widow enough to keep his children in a colored school. This was progress that was then and this is now. That was when Haytown was growing the railroad separated us. Pettigrew Street was the line. And on one side was everything that W.E.B. Du Bois referred to, booming black businesses. We didn't have to cross the railroad track for anything. But 147 came and destroyed it all. Black businesses, the promises that were made to rebuild our community were promises that were never kept. They put up 10 cities and I'm going to keep talking, which was erected, but it was a disaster. It was a joke, and it still is. Nearly 60 years later, the ability to continue to help right or wrong is present. I was in Raleigh seeing the gentrification, people being pushed out, black community gone, black businesses gone. The gentrification is happening the same in Durham. Residents from the south side, Walltown, northeast central Durham are all being pushed out but there's light at the end of the tunnel if we want it. 505 Chapel Hill Street is up. Now, we have already told you about New South Ventures. We see Carl Way up here. We talk about the Accurate Group. We talk about 33% minority ownership. What do they say they're gonna do? The promises they said. Establish a mutual district, a district that will honor the history and legacy of black-owned businesses in Durham and entrepreneurs. They say they're going to have a development team with deep roots in Durham and a track record of successful development reported already in our community. You've seen Provident 1898. You've seen the Whitted School. Local and minority investors are going to control 30% of the Ackwich joint ventures. They promise that their proposal will include 90 affordable units plus an additional eight live and work units at below market cost designed to attract artists, artisans, and small businesses. I'm almost done. Scholarships and internships. You know that's where I am, school board members. The proposal will provide $100,000 to NCCU. We need to up that price. And student internships are going to be offered. We also, they say they're going to offer an annual $5,000 to students who graduate from Durham Public Schools. We're going to up that too, because students who go into post-secondary vote to fix what we broke tonight. Fix it. Thank you, Ms. Fort Brown. 
All right. Um, I have two other people who have signed up, Mr. McCoy and Mr. Rogers, but both of them have been listed as members of the Fallon team. Um, and so uh, I think that what I will do is this. I would like to hear from both of them. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask both of them to come forward and speak for two minutes. I'm also at this time going to say to the Ackridge team, if you all have any, another four minutes will accrue to your team, if there's anything else that you all, any other people that you would like to have, Mr. Spalling, or any other comments that you all would like to make. So I'm going to begin with Mr. Rogers. You can have all the time you'd like. Mr. Rogers, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I am a local developer on the Fallon team. Uh, some of you may remember me. I was before the council in 2015, and the council was gracious enough to uh, give me a grant to assist with the project at 406 South Driver Street. Um, we did that project, and uh, we successfully completed the project. Uh, that is the reason why I'm on this team. So part, you are partly responsible for that. Uh, we did well in that project, and during the course of the project, I got to know uh, many developers, many contractors, and uh, it was an intentional effort on my part to make sure that we used um, minority labor uh, in that project. And uh, you have the, the information that I submitted to you. Uh, more than 85% of the work done in that project was with uh, minority labor. Now, I completed it, and I'm very um, proud of the project. Uh, it has generated quite a bit of activity uh, in that community. You may uh, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, I think I've seen you at uh, East Durham Bake Shop, uh, which is in the building. Um, Invictus co-working space is in the building. Uh, Signature Cuts Barbershop is in the building. Uh, we have a deli that's going to be opening soon. Uh, he leased the space about a year ago. was taking his time opening the deli. We have mixed use uh, apartments upstairs, and uh, the building has been fully occupied uh, since uh, I purchased it. Now, I named the project uh, Ashley's Corner uh, uh, after my oldest daughter who is here with me. Her name is Ashley. And I'm hoping that one day uh, she'll stand uh, here as a developer with her own project. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I am on the Fallon team and the Wind team because I developed Ashley's Corner and because I know Durham. When the Wind Company approached me earlier this year, and uh, after I had an opportunity to learn a little more about them, I was convinced that they were capable and willing to do exactly what they said they were going to do. I think it's important uh, for a developer or a contractor to be able to do what they say they're going to do. And Mr. Uh, Fallon said that integrity was an important thing for him, and I think integrity is important for, uh, for all of us. And But I, I determined after doing my research, after talking to Mr. Fallon and talking to Mr. Wynn, that uh, these guys have integrity. And I believe that they are capable of doing the job. Now, I also believe that, that they are motivated to uh, complete the task and to do what they say they're going to do. Uh, you know, if they didn't know anything about Durham, they learned something about Durham from this process. And I think what they've learned will motivate them to do uh, exactly what they say they're going to do and to, to include, to be inclusive uh, in the Durham community. Now, when they approach me, I asked them, I said, because I wanted to be a part owner uh, in order to participate. And they uh, provided me that opportunity. They didn't have to do that. Uh, that indicated to me that they were willing to be inclusive. And I hope that the council will vote to allow them uh, to do this project. I look forward to uh, seeing 500 block of West Chapel Hill Street uh, transformed. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Mr. McCoy, welcome. 
You also have two minutes. Thank you. Um, good evening, Council. Um, uh, Mayor, my name is Henry McCoy. I live at 118 Victorian Oaks Drive um, here in Durham. So uh, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about uh, this particular proposal. I'm not going to spend the time really talking about the qualifications. I think that we've heard kind of a tremendous amount of in terms of qualifications on, on both sides. I think, you know, the wind um, company is the largest affordable housing developer in the country, uh, speaks volumes and the work of the Fallon Group. I want to talk about um, my involvement in this particular project. Um, the, the connection with WIN goes back beyond this project, so this was not something that they just approached me on this particular project. I've had a relationship with WIN beyond this, and um, they've always impressed me in terms of the inclusion of what they wanted to do. do. What I really want to talk about is uh, my involvement in this particular, um, or the proposed for this particular development. Uh, we've talked a lot about equity as a part of this particular project, and I think it's important. I actually think it's actually a, a um, kind of a great night in Durham when we can stand here and kind of debate about this participation and in, in, in terms of increasing the minority, increasing the black participation in, in a project from both sides. Um, but my goal in, in terms of working with Wynn and Fallon has been looking at how do we actually broaden the equity? Uh, how do we broaden the ownership? How do we broaden the um, impact of a particular project? Particularly looking at um, the fact that we know that uh, historically uh, we've have been able to, in, in the community, sometimes aggregate um, ownership amongst a, a, a few groups. What I'm very interested in is how do we bring more and more people in Durham um, that can be part ownership of this particular property, um, coming up with innovative and creative ways to increase equity, coming up with creative ways that uh, we can uh, look at the retail component and have um, you know, black ownership uh, and black retail component, all those kind of things that I think are important to um, really spreading the wealth and not just thinking about it in a, in a very narrow way. And so um, I'm, I'm here to fully support the Fallon Group, Fallon Win um, proposition. And I think it's um, something that would be very helpful um, to spreading the wealth in Durham. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. All right, um, Mr. Spaulding. Are you all, would you, uh, do you have any other? Uh, hi. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Zena Howard. I am the um, managing director of Perkins and Will. We're the architects on the on the Akris team. Um, I'm proud to say that we moved our offices here to downtown Durham in the Mutual Tower building on the second floor more than two years ago because of this vision of a mutual district. I was fascinated. Had not heard anyone talk about anything like this before. And um, I work in many, many cities across the United States. And this was an opportunity that I was so excited about. Our proposal, first of all, does not distinguish between, uh, we don't have a poor door in our residential um, housing mix. We would never do that. Um, we develop this type of work all over the country. And it's always with the eye on being equitable and fair. We're talking about building a neighborhood, a community with the wonderful green space, a pure green space that has no vehicular traffic, no cars going through. That can be a model, we believe, for this city in conjunction with the Mutual Tower site to create a district. Durham needs the Mutual District for black people. I work all over the United States preaching about providing spaces that black people and, and the black Wall Street, restoring those, those lost visions, can provide. Our team has worked more than two years on this proposal. And regardless of, of a ranking criteria, and I know this wasn't on anyone's criteria, um, but this should be first and foremost in the hearts and minds of everyone in this room that it is important to understand that black people need to own stuff, not just be participants, not just be consultants. We need to own. And that is why I'm a member of this team. Thank you very much, Ms. Howard. Mr. Spaulding, you have two more minutes. Do you have a? OK, thank you. OK, yep. Uh, good evening. My name is Rob Bernard. I'm with Stratford Capital Group. We're the affordable housing partner um, on the transaction. Stratford Capital Group is a national developer of affordable housing. 
We've developed and invested in over 25,000 units in over 225 projects nationwide. Um, just with a few more seconds, would like to clarify one um, kind of topic on the affordable housing within the project. I think a few comments tonight focused on the concentration of affordable housing within a single building, and that has never been a component of proposal. The affordable units have always been of equal quality to the market rate units and dispersed across the entire project. Um, with, with that, I'll pass it over to Ken. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, my name again is Ken Spaulding. All I want to say is we, pay, we are paying more money, $2 million more. We have more affordable housing. We have African-American ownership in this project. Gentrification is here, and it has been here, and it is getting greater and greater. I have talked to a number of you all about that. When you go to forums, you're asked about that, especially by black residents. And I'm saying to you tonight, this gives you an opportunity, your moment in time, to be able to live up to the fact of de-gentrifying at least some part of downtown Durham. We need to have some ownership. We're not asking for a handout. We are willing to pay the $2 million more to be able to have an opportunity to be able to enjoy the fruits of the labor of us black taxpayers within this community, black and white together. That's what now we have with NSV and also what we have with Ackridge. Together, finally, 21st, 22nd century. Not ownership by itself, but ownership together. Working hand in hand, just like you all told us over at one, what is it, 150 Durham or whatever it was I was at. And that was, the, that was exactly what the message was for us. We're not hypocrites. Thank you, Mr. Spaulding. I'm going to ask for another minute. Dr. Allison, you, you can have Dr. Dr. Allison, one. Thank you. One. Let me just stay as I stand here. Equity and equal, I've talked about for years. You got to start with something before you can own anything. This situation, talking about affordable housing, I could bring in 50 people right now and ask them to give me some money so they can buy the real name for affordable. Now, trust is what you got to have. And right now, I don't trust half of the people who are sitting in this room. They've been in charge. Now, I'm, these are new people. They have proven to me that trust, when they say they're going to do something, they're going to do something. All of this is projected. And I hope this city council will understand that right now, if I ask for people to come up and give me $20,000 so that we can, in fact, decide how many people are going to buy the houses, you all got to be honest and look at what we're looking at. Right now, the school system, we can't even find enough folks to give them that. At this point, I hope you all will look at the whole room in terms of what we've got to do. Thank you, Dr. Allison. Definitely. Thank you. We've heard from the speakers tonight. Most appreciate everybody's comments. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate the presentations from both groups. And we also appreciate all the comments from members of the public. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to ask my council colleagues uh, for any questions of staff or of the developer groups or any comments that they might have at this time. I have a couple. Council Member Freeman. So I just wanted to note, I, I heard that there was a, a North Carolina Central University would be receiving $100,000. Um, is that only with this project, or is that something that you've done previously, or is that something that you're going to do? How does this factor into being a part of this project? It has to do with the passage of this project. This, this occurred before I was even brought on the team. Uh, Ackridge had been working and Carl had been working with North Carolina Central University in collaboration of trying to find a way. There is a linkage between North Carolina Central University and North Carolina Mutual. The founders of North Carolina, the founders of North Carolina Central University uh, were encouraged and worked with through the uh, founders of North Carolina Mutual. There had been the continued relationship for over the years. Catch you off as we're gonna expound on. The genesis. Go ahead with your genesis. Um, so that 
connection was something that Mr. we've Tony, always. Tony, could you introduce yourself? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is David Tony. I'm with um, Ackridge from Washington, D.C. Um, that connection between this development and outreach to um, NCCU and, and, and many other um, organizations in the community um, is something that we've done in projects in Washington and something we wanted to do on this project, particularly given the, the magnitude and, you know, quite simply, the, the need for something like that. That kind of community engagement really brings the entire city into a real estate development and the impact it can have. And it felt as if that connection with NCCU in addition to with public schools and other organizations is where that began from our original submission and was, you know, you know refined over, over time to where it is today. Do you, do you have any other projects in the city? We are developing uh, 555 Mang Mangum Street along with Northwood Raven um, that delivers at the beginning of next year. We are in the process of acquiring a, um, another building on, on North Washington Street, and we own the, the Trust Building, um, which was a building we bought from NSV a few years ago. Do any of those projects have $100,000 going to North Carolina Central? Uh, the, we have uh, scholarship projects in, in Washington, D.C. This would be our first one in Durham. Thank you. And I just had a question regarding this ownership question. Um, so I'm hearing a few folks say that there's black owned. And I'm under, I'm, the way I understood NSV was a mix. So it wasn't quite a black owned company. If you could explain, that would be helpful. NSV is a company that is owned by, the majority is owned by African Americans. Uh, we have two of the owners that are in the room. Uh, it, it helps to see that. Uh, Dwayne Washington would be one of the ones that would do that. Michael Lemansky would be the other. And so between the three of us, Dwayne Washington and Carl Webb, the two black guys, we're the ones that control the company, which is the same case with the North Carolina Mutual Building as well. And I'm also curious how that compares to the Fallon team. And I'm also kind of interested in whether or not going forward, this will be the type of question that will be asked of all developers seeking to do business in Durham. I really encourage that, and I think that would be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Other questions at this point, council member? I'll defer to some other council members that okay. have questions. If not, I have a few more. All right. Thank you. Keep going. Is there other questions for staff? Council member Austin. Stacy. Question for staff, Stacy. Thank you. I was wondering if you could just if you just summarize the relationship between the, the phasing of the construction for the two projects and the payout to the city. Sure. So just so I understand your question, um, the phasing of the projects in terms of delivery of the buildings for each of the teams? Right. And any relationship to the cash that comes to the city for the, for the property, for the, the sale? Sure. So um, let me explain the financing component first. In the latest round of proposals, the Ackridge team is proposing submitting 5% of the total amount that they're offering at the execution of the development agreement. They're proposing the other 95% within 90 days of the execution of the development agreement. The, the Fallon team is proposing 95% of the funds at execution of the development agreement and 500,000 or the remaining 5% at the point of vertical construction of the commercial building. Right. And so can you, I guess, summarize kind of your rationale for um, kind of recommending kind of Fallon's schedule uh, over the accurate schedule given the you know, differential and payout. Sure, sure. And, and maybe I'll have Kyle Vangel come up and speak to the schedule and the pro forma together. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Kyle Vangel, the consultant for the city. Um, so just in terms of that financial structure criterion, um, one of the key things that Stacy mentioned was the consideration of the pro forma in addition to the schedule. Um, so in terms of um, the pro forma, I think the city would have liked to have been able to evaluate a revised pro forma along with the revised proposal, given that there were some what seemed like significant changes to the program. Um, you know, first, um, 
in terms of the, the preservation of the existing building and the new office building, there were things that would sort of suggest that it might be difficult to ex sustain the original asking or offer of 11.25 million. Um, in terms of the, the um, construction of the, of the new building, um, you know, sort of preserving the building is a substantial change. And that wasn't, we didn't have information to sort of evaluate <coughs> how that would be done by the, by the team in terms of the costs and revenues associated with that since it was fundamentally new to the program. So it would have been nice to see that information. In addition to the costs of, of now sort of, sort of the, the new structure of the Class A office building, which was now going to be sort of built um, to some extent over the police headquarters. Um, on, the, on the revenue side, it's our expectation that the revenue generated by that sort of uh, renovated building would be less per square foot than the Class A building. So fundamentally, as part of this program, the Class A building shrunk to allow the renovated building to be kept. So it, again, would have been helpful to understand with costs potentially increasing and revenues potentially decreasing with the size of the, of the new building, um, how that price was able to be sustained. In addition to just, as Stacy mentioned, the front loading of the financial offer to, the, to a greater extent than was originally proposed by the Ackridge team, again, that might be something that would make it harder to sustain the offer price given that fundamentally accelerated payment and the higher present value associated with it. So those were some of the concerns, um, just with not being able to review the financial pro forma and understand how that affected the, the offer. Um, in terms of the schedule, you know, our understanding, because there was not a new schedule um, with this development proposal, I think you know, there were questions about the ability to deliver the original program, having essentially four buildings proceed at once, in addition to a fifth building, the renovation of the office building. And it just would have been helpful, I think, to see a revised schedule in addition to more information about the pro forma. Great. Thank you. I have a question about heights um, that maybe for either of you, I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, there were some representations made by the Ackridge Group about um, the height and the preservation of the, the sight line to the North Carolina Mutual Building. I just, want, I just wanted to reconcile maybe both proposals and have an understanding of whether or not that sight line is going to be preserved with either or both. Right, so I think what the staff memo was trying to explain was that if you look at the existing police headquarters building and the height of that building and the shape of that building, in the Fallon proposal, they proposed to put a larger office building on the rear of the site, leaving a space, a physical space that goes all the way up to the sky between the existing building and the new constructed building. In the proposal on the Ackridge team, what you see is the existing headquarters building. They're planning on ripping off the rear of the building and the staircase on there, adding another commercial building that tops over the existing building, and there will be an alleyway that you can walk through to see the mutual building. So by that construct, you will not be able to see from the interior of the site the mutual building in the same way and feel that you would in the open space that exists in the Fallon proposal. Thank you. Councilmember Caballero. No, not right now. Thank you. I'll just know. Anybody else? Any council members? Okay, I have some questions. Mm -hmm. No. We'll get to you in a minute. We'll, 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 we'll allow both teams to do a little bit of clarifying later. But we're not going to keep sort of doing it one at a time. Um, I have a few questions. Um, the, um, uh, my first question is uh, for the uh, Fallon team, uh, and uh, my question is around explicit work hour goals for women and minorities. You all have stated in, your, in the materials I've read, you've gotten a history of the, 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 your, your work hour goals for women and minorities and your MWBE goals for women and minorities in previous projects, but I wasn't clear about what they were on this project and was, would, uh, uh, could you all give me a little uh, education about that? Uh, 
Sure, Mr. Mayor. So um, to take a step back, when we talk about worker hours and minority and women-owned participation, um, we do want to point to our track record. And one of the things that we included in our proposal uh, was the accomplishment for the last two decades as the largest um, MWBE engager in the state of Massachusetts with over $7 million a year to minority-owned businesses. So when we talk about achievement, it is not about the percentages because those percentages, I presume, will come from the city in a negotiation. It is about the accomplishment of those percentages. So I will respond to that by saying, we will live by the negotiated amount and we will exceed it as that is our track record. There was not a prescribed amount. I will say that we will exceed all expectations. In the past, I wanna say we've achieved over 75% worker hours. We've achieved over 40% ownership of subcontracts. Again, those are site specific and negotiated based on the demographic. We have no doubt that we will exceed whatever uh, requirements that you proffer. Thank you. My next question is for Mr. McCoy. Um, So, uh, Mr. McCoy, I'm glad to see you. And you've uh, heard the uh, contention of the Ackridge team that the 33% uh, minority ownership is a very, uh, should be a significant factor in our considerations. And as I understand it, you've represented that you will be uh, bringing minority ownership to the Fallon Wynn group as well. Yes. Uh, could you discuss that in more detail? And I'll then ask the folks from Fallon to respond as well. Uh, but uh, could you uh, reflect on that a little bit more, please? Yeah, well, the goal um, in my mind as I've talked to the Fallon and Wynn team over the, the months was to find ways by which um, if this project was selected, um, that it could mean something beyond um, again, just a few that have ownership in it. And so um, what we've been working on is a plan that would um, look at um, creating something akin to a, um, like a community reinvestment trust that would allow people to um, be able to buy into ownership of um, particularly the space, that the retail space in the, in the retail area. What this means is that, um, you know, as the, as the, the area by which um, the building is located, as it, that area becomes more prosperous, as you have people mixed income in the building, um, that the, um, the area, the retail area, um, as it's um, collecting rents and incomes will be able to be um, growing value and that, that people um, much broader than um, just a few owners would actually be able to benefit from that. And so in looking at, at several models that would encourage, um, again, something akin to a community uh, reinvestment trust that would um, not be only excluded uh, or exclusive to um, what we call accredited investors um, in the overall investment space. And so looking at up to 50% ownership of that space um, by um, people in the community uh, with the idea that at some point in the future, um, there would be, um, you know, the income would continue to come in or there would be some exit event and the people in the community would have some benefit from that. And specifically looking at, um, uh, minority investors uh, as the primary driver of um, that equity stake. Thank you. Thank you. So could someone from the Fallon or the Wynn team also comment uh, on uh, the, uh, what Mr. McCoy just said, as well as uh, your uh, thoughts about a minority equity stake in this development? Yes, and as, Hen as Dr. McCoy just said, um, so up to half of the retail, we are gonna make available to local minority investors. And with uh, Dr. McCoy's help, I really have no doubt that we're going to accomplish that. As it relates to the housing development, we mentioned earlier that uh, from the very beginning, we've partnered with James Rogers uh, as an owner. I will say that that is a uh, percentage that rivals the net percentage um, that the opposing group is talking about 
uh, especially when you consider, I think, Councillor um, Freeman's point of what does 33% really mean when half, when half of the ownership is, is non-minority. Uh, so I, I will say that one of the things that we live by is when we make a promise, we will live by it, and the best predictor of the future is what we've done in the past. So James Rogers will be a part of the ownership of the housing. Dr. McCoy will lead up to half of the ownership in the retail, and we will meet or exceed all minority hiring goals. So when you say the retail, tell me a little bit more what that is. So each of these buildings will have mixed uses. So there will be housing and retail. In the, in the case of our development, the side that Wynn uh, heads up, so one of the things that's important is not just what the ownership of those retail spaces are, but also what the uses are. So as an example, uh, to engage in a uh, ownership of that space is one thing. And again, we will make sure that half of the ownership of those spaces is reserved for local minority owners. But in addition, what are the uses? Are they good for the community? Are they things that the community can enjoy and actually be welcome into the community. Because a lot of time, retail, especially large national branches, are not necessarily welcoming to those in the community. So it's not just about the ownership either, it's also about what the uses are. And Dr. McCoy will help us make sure that we are responsive to the needs of the community for those uses. I appreciate that. Maybe I wasn't clear enough. I'm trying to figure out half of what, so, what asset? Half of the retail component. And the retail component consists of? Consists of how many square feet? Almost 20,000 square feet of ground floor retail space. Thank Is you. That it? Yeah, thank you. If I could follow up on that question. Um, yeah. I have, uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Just, just, um, Just to clarify, you're, you're saying that 50% would be about, 20, so 40,000 square feet is retail. No, 40,000 total retail, and you're saying 20 is going to go to minority local? So 20,000 20, square feet of total retail. And, and 10,000 is And half is. will be okay. available to minority investors. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wynn, while you're up there, I have another question for you. I'll stay up here. Yeah. The, um, you've talked about uh, two potential ways to, uh, ha to you, you've talked about, for, for the affordable housing component, you've talked about a mix of incomes versus simply having the 80 units at 60% or below. Right? So one option is having the 80 units at 60% or below. Mm -hmm. Right? Another option is a mix of 30%, 50%, 60%, 80%. Yes. The council has been clear that we are interested in 80 units at 60% or below. Are you prepared to make that commitment? We are prepared to make that commitment, yes. Okay. Um, the, um, the Accridge um, group has contended that the the, having the, uh, the Fallon Group's project proceed in two phases is risky. Could you speak to that? Or perhaps Mr. Fallon would like to speak to that. Sure. The intent of the project is to bring an office building to the market quickly, which would be the police station. Once the police station has been established and the marketing center is set up, we'll start marketing for the next phase. Building it all at once doesn't seem feasible to us because you, have, you really have to attract tenants to this site, get tenants excited about the site, and then lease aggressively. So for us, bringing in the police station quickly, getting it built, and then marketing for the office building would be the best way to proceed. Understood. Uh, yeah. Just to clarify, I think you're talking about the residential and the police headquarters. Residential will start with the police station, right? Yeah. And um, so I appreciate that. Um, 
but I'm not sure it speaks to my question, which is about, is it risky, as the Ackridge uh, folks have contended, to have a two-phase project? Is it risky? I think any development has risk. Uh, we is it riskier than I to develop it, a single phase? riskier to build it all, for, from my perspective, riskier to build it all and have it sit there, as opposed to leasing it up creating and establishing a site, and then moving into the next phase. Yeah. Um, OK, I think those are all my questions for you all, and I do have some questions for staff as well. So the Ackridge Group is offering more money and you have, uh, you, uh, Ms. Poston being staff, has identified that as highly advantageous to them. And you know, money isn't everything, but it calms my nerves. And um, I think that uh, we all like to get paid more than less. So with that significant advantage, uh, or I think it's highly advantageous, because they have, they, this is an important aspect it's highly advantageous. Could you and staff uh, tell us what it is, what other advantages are so important in the Fallon Group that you are recommending them despite the price differential? So I think I'd like to have Karen Lotto come first and speak to the affordable housing, and we'll work through the elements one by one. Thank you. Good evening, Karen Lotto, Department Ms. of Ms. Lotto, excuse me one second. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I just want to say to Mr. Banks and Mr. Spaulding, um, after we all finish, I'm going to give each group three minutes to respond to whatever you'd like, okay? If there are any things that you all would like to respond to that has been said, um, sir, you, you had some comments previously, so I just want to let you know that's coming. We're going to, once we work through all the council members' comments and so forth, I want to make sure that each of the uh, developer groups has the opportunity uh, to respond. Okay, I'm sorry, Ms. Lotto. No problem. So Karen Lotto, Community Development Department. Um, on the affordable housing component, uh, City Council set as a goal 80 units at 60% of area median income. Both of the proposals delivered on that goal. Um, in terms of the ranking, staff differentiated um, for several factors. The first was uh, the strength of the affordable housing developer. While both teams had strong affordable housing developers, um, the staff assessment was that Wynn was the stronger, both not just in the development of affordable housing, but in the management <coughs> of affordable and mixed income communities with a particular focus on creating community within those buildings and creating kind of opportunities for their residents within those buildings. And in this assessment, we were looking not just at that building, but also at the prospect of bringing Wynn into our market long term. Um, the second piece was that the um, financial model that uh, Wynn was offering, was proposing, is actually, while it relies on low-income housing tax credits, um, not the competitive version, um, but rather the version that is that is readily available. It is a model that has not been done in North Carolina. Um, this kind of scatter site condoizing of, of of a four percent low income housing tax credit model. It is a model that once we demonstrate it, is potentially replicable in Durham, and would be a useful um, strategy for us to pursue for future affordable housing development in Durham. Um, so we saw that also as, as an advantageous um, model to the city. Um, we did note that Ackridge did um, commit to providing um, 10 units at 80% of area median income, and that was kind of in the plus category in their category. It was not a strong weight because um, at this point, 80% of area median income is not a priority for the city, and according to the plan that council has adopted, for rental housing because outside of downtown, 80% is really where our market is um, right now for rental housing. Um, so 
We did note it as a positive, but we felt that the other factors with the affordable housing um, outweighed. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Summer Alston, Office of Economic and Workforce Development. As it relates to the commercial component of the development program in particular, our office, the Durham Chamber, and Downtown Durham Incorporated have long advocated for the need for additional Class A office space in and around our downtown. As we've discussed previously, as we presented to you, this site is uniquely situated. There is not another site like this in, in the vicinity of downtown. It affords us a perfect opportunity for a large scale commercial development that can attract a headquarters tenant with visibility from the freeway. This has been a tenant throughout this process and, the, and in this case, we are presented with two programs, one of which offers us as much as 135,000 square feet more commercial office. There is always risk, there is always market to be considered, but that much of a difference in the delivery of office space is very meaningful in our market and it is a needful thing. Thank you, Ms. Austin. Good evening, I'm Sarah Young with the Planning Department and I wanna talk a little bit about the design aspects um, that we looked at. One is, as was mentioned previously, in terms of preservation of the Milton Small Building, the historic structure. Um, while the Fallon proposal does do a small intervention at the ground plane, it does maintain the original transparency at the ground plane of the building that was a hallmark of that era of construction. I think more importantly is the fact that it preserves sight lines to the Mutual Tower, which is a designated local historic landmark, whereas the Milton Small Building is not. And so that is an important consideration that, that we looked into as well. It preserves more sight lines to the designated landmark. In other terms, while both uh, projects contain a fair amount of open space, we believe that the open space um, more seamlessly flows on the Fallon project. It, the massing overall is lower at the street and is more respectful of adjacent development in the Fallon project. And most of the massing is kind of contained towards the back of the site um, in terms of height. Um, again, being a little more respectful, particularly to the church across the street. And I think the last thing that was a consideration was that um, there was no um, exposed parking along a street frontage. Um, that the parking was uh, podium parking, wrapped parking, um, uh, so that the neighbors did not have to look directly at a parking garage. Thank you. Bo Ferguson, Deputy City Manager for Operations. So just, just want to summarize, Mayor, I think your question to Stacy was, you know, what, what are the points that, that counterbalance the significant financial offer? And I, I think the, the, the summary comments I want to offer is, what we feel like council tasked us with in the beginning was to come up with a scheme by which to evaluate proposals. Uh, and we started a conversation with council that gave us these five criteria. Ultimately, um, our job it was to create an analysis system that looked at uh, what the development teams provided us and pr tried to provide an objective analysis. The, in the end, there was no trump card. So uh, we did not treat um, we did not treat any one of the five factors as trumping all of the other four factors. Uh, so when we uh, uh, settled on this final recommendation to you, it was looking at which proposal we thought delivered the highest benefit in each of the five categories and how well did they work together. And so ultimately, the, the three points that, that were just presented to you, I would describe as impactful in our discussions but it was a conversation amongst all the, the, the resources, both the staff who've spoken to you tonight and other staff who were as part of this team that ultimately relayed that recommendation. No, no one of the five criteria, but all five of the criteria, and that's where we settled on our recommendation. Thank you. All right, uh, other questions by members of the council? Any other questions by members of the council at this point? Yeah, I had a question mm -hmm. for um, Mr. McCoy. Councilmember Caballero. Mr. McCoy, Dr. McCoy. Yeah, just corrected myself there. Busy tonight. Yes. I wanted to have a, a little bit more conversation around the 10,000 square foot of retail. Um, when you discuss minority owned, 
Uh, will there be also conversations around, I'm just thinking about like technical assistance to get folks into that building because sometimes what we know from our marginalized communities um, is that they don't necessarily have the, they need the help around the business um, development. And so just trying to figure out how would that space work and then are you, are you broadening that view of what you're considering minority to include the Latinx community? Yeah, I think um, from this particular standpoint, um, to answer your question, um, the idea is to find the right, well, so there's a couple of components to think about this in terms of space. So one is the, the equity component, right? So so the actual capital goes in and, and kind of who owns that. The second piece is the uses of it, and so who goes into the particular space. And so we've had a, a, a intense conversation about finding the right um, businesses to go into space that are also minority as well, so that you... You, in some ways, you're, um, I don't want to call it double dipping, but you're, 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 you have an ownership, but you're also having um, the, the actual ability to be in the particular space. Um, and to answer your question, um, um, you know, I, I think it's very important to um, think about how can we make the space as in inclusive as possible. Um, I don't want to kind of trail off, but um, I, I literally today uh, in my class at NCCU, we talked about the article that came out in um, New York Times in April 2018 about who belongs downtown. And, uh, and it was, you know, the, the article really focused around the idea that there's um, a feeling of, a, of exclusion for particularly on, on the black community and things of that nature. Um, my conversation today with students was about, well, what does it take to make a vibrant downtown where everybody feels um, um, welcome? And I, I think that the designs that have been laid out in the, in the uh, Fallon Wind proposal with the um, the green space and thinking about the retail component, uh, I think it's a critical opportunity to, to really actually create a space where um, you can bring um, um, all communities together in Durham. And in terms of the, the technical assistance component, you know, I, 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 you know I'm, I'm one of those who for a long time have argued that, um, you know, we have um, very capable and, and strong minority businesses out there, right? Um, a lot of times it's a matter of finding the right ones and, and offering the right opportunity, particularly as it relates to access to capital and, and opportunity. And so um, I feel like that, um, you know, when you have a, a prime space, as we've heard, I mean, that, you know, there's a tremendous opportunity there with the um, Class A space, with the, um, the mixed income inside of the space that you know, we can find the, the right entrepreneurs to be in the space. And so you're benefiting, again, not only from ownership and the rise in value, but also in being in that particular space and the incomes that come to that, and that can have um, additional benefits out into the community from that standpoint. So I think that it can be a very inclusive space to be um, uh, inclusive of um, black and brown folks here in Durham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, uh, I'm gonna now ask uh, for each of the developer groups if you all would like to make three minutes uh, worth of comments and uh, I'll begin with Ackridge. Any summary comments that you all would like to make? Let me just say to both groups that the clock's gonna be running with three minutes and this time, since it's not Dr. Allison or uh, Dr. Fort Brown, who I always give extra minutes to, I'm gonna hold you all to the three minutes. I said that I'm going to give each of these groups just three minutes. Yeah. Because I said I like to give you extra. I like to give you extra time, Dr. Allison, but I don't do it for everyone. Okay, let's go. Okay. <laughs> you got all the time you want. Sheila, welcome. Thank Glad you. to see you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Gloria Sheely. I'm president of the Danielle Company. We are a woman-owned African-American general contractor and construction manager uh, based downtown Durham in the heart of all of this. Um, the, the two things, and I wasn't going to speak, but I do want to uh, say a couple of things that I think is important. Um, I've been here before where both teams are equally capable of delivering the physical product that you're talking about, and I think that's the case here. I think that there is also um, a confidence level from both to be able to do that in the integrity of the process. But this is about more than that. And it is an opportunity to make a distinction um, around what equity and inclusion uh, really means. 
and it means the entire community. Um, we've done this on the contracting side. We do this all day, every day. That's what we do. We have the relationships in the community, the African-American community, the Hispanic community. Um, we have a great person involved to help us with that. So I would offer to you that you look at what equity really means. And it is about ownership. And it's not about a partial ownership. It's about full engagement in the process. And I think Accridge has presented that in expanding beyond that 33% others that can be involved as well. I look forward to being a part of that as well. Thank, Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Gloria. It's a perfect segue into the first point I want to make. I'm going to talk fast because I've got a lot I want to cover. Uh, one is we've been absolutely transparent in both our uh, minority equity participation at a third. Um, we've added an additional 5% uh, that would be available for equity participation to the local community. That 5% would um, substantially eclipse 10,000 square feet of retail. I also want to say that we've been totally transparent that we would have a minimum goal of 25% MWBE participation in the contracting level. We also talked about, uh, in my opening remarks, about the fact that our program did not substantially change. Our office and residential waiting did not move materially. As a result, we looked and scrubbed through all of the economics of our proposal. We pressure tested it with contractors. Our performers and schedules remained consistent with what we had when we initially submitted, which is why we didn't submit anything additional, because our basic framework that we submitted in June remained uh, directionally accurate with what our financial proposal is today. At the end of the day, this is about facts. We gave you a scorecard about facts and the five uh, most important weighting elements that were in the proposal, which involved uh, price, affordable housing units, uh, and other key design elements that our, our partner who owns North Carolina Mutual endorses how our design addresses. We feel very confident that those elements all layer in to the priorities that the council established in the fact-based analysis relative to the weighting criteria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now ask for the Fallon team. Uh, you also have three minutes and no more than three minutes. So, Mayor and Council, I didn't know we'd be doing a he said, she said. What I do want to do is identify that we've been doing things that we just haven't talked through. Um, our contractor is Holt Brothers Construction uh, with a significant track record here. Terrence. Terrence right there working with us on the construction side. Our bank is Mechanic and Farmers Bank. Uh, it's a community bank, a minority bank. We're not just talking about it. We're doing it. And for us to sit down, we could easily start sitting down and listing all of the things that we've done. I didn't understand that was the purpose of tonight, but we can do that. So for us, it's important that you understand that our proposal is a proposal we stood by from the very beginning. Um, it's not something we talk about. It's things that we do. So um, I want you to understand that. I think, uh, Sharad, you wanted to have a couple other comments? Oh, sure. Gil? Thank you. I, and I want to add something that was a really important question, Mr. Mayor, that you asked about the financing and about risk. So with 95% of the purchase price being offered at the signing of the development agreement, that takes the risk off the table for the city. So I just want to state unequivocally, when 5% is given at development signing. What's that old saying about, you know, a bird in the hand, okay? 95% of the purchase price of the competing proposal is on the come, while 95% of our proposal is at the beginning. Joe Fallon and I stick by this project. We are not changing our proposal to match anyone else's. This has been our proposal from the beginning. I think you can take solace in that that will deliver. Thank you. We thank you for your time. We thank you for your efforts. We thank you for your diligence. And we're prepared for your vote. Thank you. All right, council members. We've heard from the groups. We've heard from members of the public. Any other questions for staff? Any other questions for staff? All right, matters now before the council. Council members. I move for approval. 
Move for approval. A future disposition and redevelopment of 505 West Chapel Hill Street. All righty. You've moved the staff recommendation that we approve the Fallon Company. Is there a second? Second. So we moved and second that we approve the Fallon Company, and now I'll ask for any discussion by members of the council. Anybody? Okay, well, I'll, I'll do a little discussing. First of all, I want to appreciate uh, both of the groups uh, that are here tonight. There's absolutely no question in my mind uh, that both of the groups uh, that presented really good proposals, and not just in my mind, but the more important than, than in my mind, in the mind of staff. Uh, the, these two groups were the final two groups for a reason. Um, and um, that reason, those reasons have been uh, borne out by the proposals that uh, we were able to review. Um, I got a notebook this thick that I've been reading this week. Uh, and have a much appreciated being able to read all the detail from everyone. Um, uh, I've appreciated, uh, and, and so I'll just say, I agree that either one of these groups could do a good job here. We are very fortunate. Uh, 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 I believe it was Mr. Tony, I, I was talking about the, the current projects that Ackridge has going in our city, and we're very grateful to have Ackridge as a great corporate citizen of Durham. Uh, I really want to appreciate our staff. Uh, we have uh, been very well served by your diligence and analysis. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues said today, I think it was Councilmember Freeman, I believe it was Councilmember Freeman, saying that the, the analysis by staff was um, especially uh, the, that the fact that it was kind of interdepartmental and cross-departmental and that you engage so many people within the city to bring their, their various expertises in, I'm very appreciative of. Um, I think that um, this, is, this is a tough decision. Um, I am very uh, persuaded by the, um, uh, the analysis of staff in terms of the, very, the factors that we set out. We set out the five factors the staff broke them into kind of nine sub-factors, and I found the analysis extremely persuasive. Um, no question that Ackridge is offering more money, uh, and staff had to, therefore, I think, make, a, in my mind, make a strong case that the other factors outweigh this. Uh, and having reviewed that, having heard about it at the work session, and having read it, I did feel that way. But that left me, I'll just speak for myself, thinking about yet another factor, which we had not prescribed, but which is a factor in all of the work that we do, which is to think, thinking about uh, the inclusivity uh, and, uh, of this. And I think Mr. Webb said earlier that um, it would be good if we made this explicit in our future development uh, proposals, should we get any of those like this, and I agree with that. Uh, and yet, I think that we all know that it is implicit in everything we do. Um, I am um, and we've heard from, let's just say, on both sides of this issue of um, what these two developers will bring to our minority communities from in, in, you know, just uh, leading citizens of Durham on behalf of both developers. We've heard from Mr. Banks, Dr. McCoy, Mayor Bell, uh, the Holt brothers are included, Mr. Rogers, inclusion of mechanics and farmers, Ms. Brown, uh, Dr. Allison. We've heard from Mr. Spaulding, Mr. on the other hand, Mr. Webb, Ms. Sheely, Mr. Beasley, Mr. Myers, Michael Page on behalf of North Carolina Central University, Ms. Howard. And I, I'm uh, very impressed with the fact that this has inspired, that this process has inspired this kind of uh, uh, attention and concern about this issue of inclusion. Um, I am, I, I do think that, um, you know, my, I, I wish that uh, Fallon was, had been, had named an exact percentage. 
uh, concerning uh, what the um, uh, minority equity stake will be. And I'm appreciative that Ackridge did that. I think that is an advantage for Ackridge. Uh, but I am also, uh, I, I, will, I am, from, every, from the record that I have seen, and I have read the whole record, uh, I am also convinced that you all are people who have been able to do what you've said in terms of inclusion, and I think that uh, uh, that it speaks very well for you and gives me confidence. So uh, I'm going to be supporting the staff recommendation uh, and, uh, on that basis. I will just say, I think I should say uh, uh, just a couple other things about the staff recommendation. I do think that in terms, of the, in terms of the affordable housing, I don't think there's, to me, uh, both groups, again, I think crossed the threshold. Uh, but I think that it, it, I agree very much with staff's analysis of why the uh, wind proposal is preferable um, in terms of the self-financing, uh, the 4% the scattered site condoizing. Uh, I think is a is a very unique and valuable contribution, um, and I also think that the that the in, in my mind the additional commercial space is a substantial, very substantial advantage. If I was to say one thing that I hear constantly in this community from, you know, what is it that Durham doesn't have? What is it that we lack? One one thing that I hear constantly and that I believe myself is that we lack major office space for a major corporate headquarters. This is a civic, uh, this is a tremendous civic need. Um, we are constantly, I think, um, challenged by the fact that we don't have that. There's no guarantee that we will get such a headquarters with the Fallon proposal, but I think that the chances are decent and we will certainly be counting on you all should you all uh, be uh, chosen through the negotiation process after the vote of the council, should we prove it, that you all would be making, bending every, every effort to make that happen. Um, yeah, so those are my comments, and I'll uh, ask any other member of the council to have a comment. Councilmember Austin. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your comments, Mr. Mayor. First, I um, want to thank staff for your focus, your objectivity, and uh, your nimble responses to this process over the last several weeks. Uh, to both the teams, these are both incredibly impressive teams. Uh, you both took our direction to heart. Uh, you brought important considerations to our analysis and created two proposals that um, both of whom married our, the development opportunity that we have before us now and our values through incredibly creative concepts that I hope will be modeled uh, uh, by other developments in the future here in this city. Uh, I do intend to support the staff's recommendation uh, and vote for the Fallon proposal uh, for many of the reasons outlined by the mayor, but in particular, the percentage of the cash or the money that's going to be paid up front at the disposition of the property, uh, their work with an affordable housing developer with a proven track record, uh, the provision of a significant amount of office space, but I think in particular, a provision of that office space at diverse price points uh, or you know, uh, rental rates, whatever the case may be, that I think will be very important uh, here in Durham. Uh, the immediate activation of Chapel Hill Street with the redevelopment of the building, and I think unique and appropriate reuse of that current site. So I think this is an exciting step forward uh, for the city and for Durham. I want to thank both the teams for their participation in the process and look forward to moving this forward this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments by members of the council? Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, when we face hard decisions on the council, it's generally between doing a thing and not doing a thing. We get people on the controversial ones that really want us to do a thing. We got people that really want us not to do that thing. And so we're often faced with these very binary choices. I can't remember a time when we've made a decision that was hard because both of the options were really great for the city of Durham. And I just want to thank staff for teeing this up for us to make this really <laughs> difficult decision. Uh, maybe thanks isn't the right word, but thank you anyway. Um, and I really wanna thank the all-star teams put together uh, by the Ackridge and Fallon folks. Um, it, just not the kind of 
choice that we are often faced with. And so it's a blessing and a curse in many ways because whatever thing we do, whichever of these projects we choose will be a benefit to the city um, and the curse is we have to make the best choice we can. Um, I, um, I didn't make my decision until a few minutes ago. That's how close these two proposals have been to me throughout the process. I spoke to, spoken as many of us have, a ton of people in the community about what they want out of this project. And um, just as an aside, I just wanted to, having uh, former Mayor Bill Bell here tonight to talk to us about this reminded me that when we were uh, in the throes of trying to decide what to do with the property uh, directly adjacent to Durham Station, uh, Mayor Bell um, was a strong advocate for mixed income housing. And um, the project that's now the Willow Street Apartments went a different direction. But ironically, we are here again with another much larger piece of city-owned property. Um, and both of the very good proposals before us are mixed income proposals. And so I just wanted to say as an aside Mayor, for Mayor Bell, um, glad to see that whichever way we go, your vision of a truly mixed income community um, near the heart of downtown will be realized after, by what we do tonight. And I want to thank you for your leadership on that over the years. Um, it's almost unfair that the Fallon Group brought not only former Mayor Bill Bell, but Dr. Livonia Allison to the, to the, to the podium tonight to advocate for uh, what I think is, by fractions, the superior proposal tonight. Um, the weakest portion of the Fallon proposal, in my mind, is the uh, unstated uh, minority ownership percentage. And that's something we've, that's been discussed. Um, uh, by contrast, I think the two strongest uh, factors of the Fallon proposal are, as my colleagues have said, uh, the fact that, um, that the financial investment, the return that the city receives is almost entirely upfront. Um, but number two, I think the ability to bring um, a nationally recognized uh, affordable housing developer into our community to partner with them um, and to show them what good partners the city of Durham can be and uh, to begin what I hope will be a long and fruitful relationship. Um, with respect to the Ackridge proposal, let me just say that there's very little bad about it. There's many fantastic aspects to it. Um, I'm particularly appreciative of Ackridge's, appreciative of Ackridge's commitment around uh, minority ownership, which we've heard a number of speakers tonight say how important that is. And I also want to thank uh, the folks in the community who've come out and supported the Ackridge proposal. Um, but I think by fractions, by the merest margin, I do believe that the Fallon proposal is the, is the superior proposal of the two. I think either way we decide to go tonight, the city of Durham will be better for what we do. Um, and that's all I had to say about that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Mayor Pro Tem. Of course. Um, thank you. I just wanted to um, also express my thanks to both the teams and to our staff. This has been a long process to get us to this decision, um, and I really appreciate everyone being so engaged and um, the work of our staff to, to get us to where we are. I'm also gonna be supporting the staff recommendation. Um, I think that the, the proposals are both really good. And of course we you know, very rarely have a situation where we have to decide between two really great um, options. And I'm also very grateful for that, for having two really good options for the city of Durham. Um, I, I think that the um, information that's been provided to us by staff about the advantages to the Fallon proposal are persuasive to me. And, um, and so I'll be supporting that proposal tonight. But I do, you know, I think as everyone is going to say, think that the Ackridge proposal is also really good. And so this is a really hard choice. Um, and I just want to appreciate the fact that we are where we are in Durham, where we, have this caliber of um, of company of developer coming to us to to do this kind of project here in our city. Um, I think it's really a, it's just really great that we have so many qualified folks vying for the opportunity to invest here in our city, and I'm also really grateful for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 
Council Member Caballero. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who came out. Um, thank you to our staff who's prepared excellent documents, uh, has walked us through a lot of um, very technical information uh, that at times was hard to wrap our heads around. Um, both development groups here have been, you know, originally, I'll just be honest, without the saving of the building, it was a pretty clear-cut decision for me just because of the community input that we were hearing around preserving the building. Uh, then the Ackridge folks updated their pro proposals. So then it it was this very hard balancing act around well, what do we <coughs> what do we want to see in Durham? Um, I will be I will be supporting the Fallon group tonight as well. Um, partly and I'll say we often lean on our staff and one of the things that I know I've said continuously is we often operate in silos. This, this group does this, we don't interconnect our projects, we don't have a holistic view. And this project was an, an exemplar model of the kind of um, work that I expect from staff and you all just really knocked it out of the park. Uh, so thank you because that is the expertise that helps me make a better decision. Um, for all groups that are here before us, we will be watching, I know I will be watching to see that you deliver uh, especially the, you know, the Fallon group here and Ackridge because we know you have other um, projects in Durham that you are helping our most marginalized communities build wealth because that is the only way we're going to battle this problem around gentrification in this community. When I say all communities, I mean all communities, uh, black, brown, and white. Um, and I know that this community space in the Fallon pro project gives us an opportunity to create something really beautiful in Durham, and I expect you all to really uh, think that through and provide a space where everyone feels welcome. Thank you. <coughs> Any other comments? I guess since everyone else is. I, um, I can't help but be honest. I was blown away by Fallon's proposal immediately. I, um, I have to say that I was underwhelmed by what Ackridge proposed in the beginning. It's really, you uh, definitely stepped it up and I appreciate that. I wanna say that I really wanna thank the entire Ackridge group for proposing, um, putting their best foot effort in pushing us to realize just what we have here in Durham. Uh, we have a very good uh, talent pool of folks here who could develop just what we need for ourselves and so that for us, by us, could actually be realized in uh, future projects. I am, um, I, I definitely have, I think prior to tonight, I probably would have just gone with Fallon and tonight I'm really pushing like going back and forth in my mind on whether or not it should be Ackridge, knowing that you guys are local and recognizing that it is important to make sure that when there are organizations that come, come across in, in the, the way in which it did tonight, which was to use your integrity and trust and kind of conversation, it, it really rubs me the wrong way. And I'm, I'm, still, I'm still on edge on that one. Um, but I do know that the conversation around equity is where I want to see us move and as a whole, as a city, and it's not, just not black, brown, and white, but also Asian and indigenous. Everyone in this city should be able to have access to shared prosperity, and it's important that we make sure that black wealth is built, because at the base of the issue with our gun violence is black men. And if we don't recognize that black men need to be held up in this because of the disparities that, have, that they have faced in the past, we will lose. Um, that being said, I really, really want to thank um, uh, James Rogers and Carl Webb for being uh, driving forces in these conversations because it's important to note that these two black men are standing here today bringing both of these groups together um, to bring this project to Durham. And I am very proud. I'm very honored to have uh, the decision-making ability in this. I unfortunately do not feel <laughs> good about um, how this vote is going to go tonight, but uh, I do want to say that it's probably um, in in relation to how I feel about how we should support our staff that my vote tonight will be in support of our staff's recommendation and recognizing that when staff makes the proper protocol, like takes the time to build out the proper protocol and follows the process and uses all the tools that, they're re that they have at their, their um, hand, it's important to make sure that I, as a council member, support them. And so I just want to let you know that um, 
I will be supporting the filing group tonight. Any more comments? We have a motion and a second that we support the staff recommendation. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Right. I want to thank both groups for being here tonight. Very much appreciate it. And I believe that is the last, item, the last uh, item to come before us tonight. And I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 10 o'clock. Thank you.